मैं इंग्लिश में ही बात रखूंगा क्योंकि मुझे कम्पटेरी के पेपर के बारे में ही बात रखनी है और जरूरत होगी तो बाद में उसको हिंदी में ट्रांसलेट कर देंगे फर्स्ट आई वुड लाइक टू कॉन्ग्रेचुलेट कॉम्पेट एरिक फॉर सच अ वंडरफुल प्रेजेंटेशन मेनी ऑफ द इश्यूज मेनी ऑफ द इश्यूज विच आर जनरली नॉट अंडरस्टूड इन अ प्रॉपर माउस्ट फैशन सम बेसिक कॉन्सेप्ट वॉट इज अ फंडामेंटल कॉन्ट्रडिक्शन वॉट इज अ प्रिंसिपल कॉन्ट्रडिक्शन वॉट इज द रिलेशन बिटवीन फंडामेंटल कॉन्ट्रडिक्शन एंड प्रिंसिपल कॉन्ट्रडिक्शन द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ रेजोल्यूशन ऑफ principal contradiction in order to advance towards the resolution of fundamental contradiction and how a political conjuncture plays a role in this generally these basic concepts are missing uh, from the papers and presentations and essays uh, uh, from different ml groups in india uh, different uh, marxist leninist individuals in india and these are some basic things which must be stated at the very outset in order to uh, <coughs> deal with such an issue but generally dealing with such a uh, serious issue generally people uh, do not present this kind of analysis and that's why uh, this presentation is uh, very significant uh, for this seminar for all the revolutionary cadre and all of us uh having said that there are certain points at which uh, i find myself i won't say uh in conflict but uh, a completely disagreement with comrade eric's paper uh despite having a very solid ideological political ground uh i find i think it seems to me that this paper has deduced the tasks for today from the general line of 1963 in some way uh without presenting any concrete analysis of the changes that took place between 1963 and 2017 uh except the fact that the paper admits that semi feudalism or feudalism may not be the dominant uh relations in a number of third world countries now but despite that admission in my opinion the paper somehow falls short of uh, identifying the changes uh, in the uh, stage in which the world revolutionary process is uh, right now and i would uh, make some concrete arguments about it one is that uh, the political behavior of the bourgeoisie of countries even like syria uh, or uh, ukraine or any other third world countries which are presently the site of inter imperialist rivalry and which uh, owing to the fact that they are sites of uh, uh, inter imperialist rivalry are in the stage of uh, national liberation so uh, for example the historical analysis of the baath party in syria is not provided and it is assumed though it's not mentioned but it is assumed uh, in an unsaid way that the syrian bourgeoisie is a comprador maybe of russian imperialism if we say that and if we also claim that semi feudalism is not there or in many third world countries semi feudal or feudal relations are not there the burden uh, is upon us to explain how the semi feudal or feudal relations were done away with who did away with the semi feudal relations if there was never a national bourgeoisie in power or even a in using mao's words if there was no even reactionary national bourgeoisie in power ever in syria then who did carry out these uh, democratic tasks that feudal and semi feudal relations are not there anymore number 1 and if we accept that there was a national or reactionary national bourgeoisie in power at some point of time after the process of decolonization started for example in countries like ukraine syria and many other uh, third world countries 
then what happened to them? If now we characterize them as comprador, what happened in this period when they became independent, implemented certain kind of land reforms, certain kind of uh, democratic reforms or democratic uh, tasks were completed in a peculiar way in these countries. If we accept that, then it is our duty also to explain that why it would it should be considered a comprador of Russian imperialism, for example, the Syrian bourgeoisie. That is one point. <coughs> Secondly, uh, I find another thing, uh, and I wondered about it because it's such a well-written paper and well-structured and laid bare the basic, uh, uh, clearly stipulates the foundational things about Maoist analysis, but there is no concrete analysis of the, there is no empirical analysis or even not empirical, but even the factual analysis of the behavior of uh, bourgeoisie in these countries. So it's kind of the, uh, it's like this, that the 63 general line is uh, there and we are deducing the current contradictions and we are deducing uh, the principal contradictions of today from that general line it has to be supported with some kind of factual fact based empirical data based or even not data fact based uh, a study of concrete concrete study of the behavior of ruling class in these countries it must be supported by that otherwise it becomes just a restatement with certain changes of the general line of 63 so because uh, as Mao said, we should uh, derive truth from facts. So there should be a concrete analysis of the behavior of bourgeoisie in countries like India, Indonesia, Turkey, Brazil, Argentina, Syria, in certain countries of Middle East, all these countries. So that is another thing that I wanted to point out. Third uh, thing that I wanted to talk about is that uh, the comment of Chinese Communist Party on Bandung Conference and the Non-Alignment Movement, first conference of Non-Alignment Movement in 1961, where uh, the CPC says that the newly, about the Bandung Conference and the Non-Alignment Movement, the crux of their uh, appreciation of these two events was that these newly independent countries organized on such forums, creating pressure on imperialism, is a positive thing. Their anti-imperialist unity is positive and progressive. So what, because the assessment of these countries, the behavior of bourgeoisie in these countries, whether it was politically independent or not, the assessment by Chinese party was, we believe it was under progress. It was constantly changing because, for example, in uh, 1973, though Deng Xiaoping was the foreign minister, he gave an address to the UN assembly in which he said that these countries are politically independent and economically dependent, therefore the national independence is not consummated. This is a contradictory statement because if they are politically independent, economic dependence is a totally purely quantitative thing. It can happen even within the imperialist country. There are various degrees of economic dependence within the advanced capitalist countries and imperialist countries. The basic thing is political dependence. If it accepts that it is political independence, it should also be accepted and it might be a slip or uh, we should be allowed to criticize the Chinese Communist Party as well. It can be a slip but if you accept that it is politically independent, that the, then the natural corollary is that the national independent is, uh, independence is consummated. Because otherwise it will become a totally economistic yardstick to determine whether the country is independent or not. Moreover, even about the Indian bourgeoisie, the assessment of Chinese Communist Party was constantly changing. In 1952, Nehru is called reactionary national bourgeoisie. In 1959, in two articles on Nehru's philosophy, and the second article was more on Nehru's philosophy, for the first time, the Chinese Communist Party characterizes him as a comprador. So in 52, it was reactionary national bourgeoisie, and in 59, it was comprador. How? Why? We need to understand. I am not criticizing the Chinese Communist Party on this point because 
assessments change and assessments constantly change with changing realities which uh, might be wrong which which might be correct or incorrect that's a different point uh, this different thing altogether but the assessments and the evaluations done by the chinese communist party about the uh, newly independent countries in the late 50s early 50s 60s was not uh, consistent it was constantly changing second thing i would just quote from the general uh, line presented in 1963 which in my opinion it means that the general line uh, kind of tells about the orientation of the newly independent country it points out the dual character of the nation the bourgeoisie which came into the power, into power in these newly independent countries and it also prescribed the communist forces of these countries to adopt a two fold strategy uh, towards this bourgeoisie uh, in so far as it completes the democratic tasks it should the, the communist party should form alliance with it and in so far as it uh, collaborates it doesn't say that cow cow or it doesn't say that it sells it uh, out to imperialism it just says in so far as it, it collaborates and compromises with imperialism uh we should oppose it so i will just read it uh from quoting from the general line of 63 the nationalist countries which have recently won political independence are still confronted with the arduous tasks of consolidating it liquidating the forces of imperialism and domestic reaction carrying out agrarian and other social reforms and developing their national economy and culture it is of practical and vital importance for these countries to guard and fight against the neo colonialist policies which the old colonialists adopt adapt hona chahiye adapt to preserve their interests and especially against the neo neo colonialism of the us imperialism in some of these countries the patriotic national bourgeoisie continues to stand with the masses in the struggle against imperialism and colonialism and introduce certain measures of social progress this requires the proletarian party to make a full appraisal of the progressive role of the patriotic national bourgeoisie and strengthen unity with them as the internal social contradictions and the international class struggle sharpen the bourgeoisie and particularly the big bourgeoisie in some newly independent countries increasingly tend to become retainers of imperialism and to pursue anti popular anti communist and counter revolutionary policies it is necessary for the proletarian party resolutely to oppose these reactionary policies generally speaking the bourgeoisie in these countries have a dual character when a united front is formed with the bourgeoisie the policy of the proletarian party should be one of both unity and struggle the policy should be to unite with the bourgeoisie in so far as they tend to be progressive anti imperialist and anti feudal but to struggle against their reactionary tendency to compromise and collaborate with imperialism and the forces of feudalism on the national question the world outlook of the proletarian party is internationalism and not nationalism in the revolutionary struggle it supports the progressive nationalism and opposes reactionary nationalism it must always draw a clear line of demarcation between itself and bourgeois nationalism to which it must never never fall captive so there are many things which should be noted here national liberation movements cannot be supported uh, without taking into consideration the particular political conjuncture in which these national liberation movements are situated and that is the position which the bolshevik party took during the civil war certain for example ukrainian nationalists and many other uh, nationalists were taking side of the reactionary white forces then it can call chak wrangle and it was a clear position of uh, the bolshevik party that the national national the task of national liberation should be subordinated to the interests of proletarian revolution it doesn't really matter whether there is already a, uh, an existing socialist state or not because interests of proletarian revolution can can cannot simply be reduced to the existence of socialist state or not even if there is no socialist state if we take the entire middle east region right now under consideration and we uh, recognize the fact that the single knot of contradictions of imperialism right now are situated in the middle east not just syria but in the middle east and the role of the sdf in that situation in totality if we take the whole picture 
into consideration, there is no possibility, no point of supporting SDF, which is siding what if we in the context of Syrian struggle, if we support SDF or in this context of the uh, Kurdish uh, national liberation, if we support the SDF, what about North Iraq? And why should not we take into consideration the interests of Iraqi oppressed nationality and just take the cons uh, under consideration the interest of Kurdistan? So uh, this, is, this must be taken into consideration. The second thing which is clear from uh, this uh, general line, the section that I quoted, is that the general line says that right now the situation is that there are certain countries in which patriotic national bourgeoisie is there and it has a dual character. It can turn towards reaction in the main and it can turn towards the democratic path in the main. Depending on that, the <coughs> depending on that, the communist revolutionaries in these countries should determine their attitude towards these uh, uh, ruling classes. Now, 54 years have passed. We need to answer, has anything changed or not? In 63, it was a very uh, open-ended, tentative assessment of the situation in these countries. Now, in 54 years, we need to explain what has changed. So, if we say that nothing has changed and these countries are still, okay, not semi-feudal, semi-colonial, but neo-colonial and their bourgeoisie is comprador, then we'll need, we need, because every exposition of a fundamental contradiction or principal contradiction is meaningful in so far as it can tell us something about the strategic class alliance in these countries. So, it must tell also about how in a country like India, I, I, I assume that Comrade Eric agrees that in India maybe it's difficult to form four class alliance, except there is an imperialist invasion and somehow with some miraculous turn of history, India becomes the site of inter-imperialist rivalry and intervention. In that case also, for example, if India suddenly imperialism finds out that India has larger oil reserves and uh, larger amount of uh, mineral resources and different kinds of uh, geopolitical contradictions also are creating a political conjuncture geopolitically in India and suddenly uh, imperialism leaves uh, the Middle East alone and comes to India and invades India for example and Russian imperialism comes into support of the Indian bourgeoisie. It's true that any communist force will form a short term tactical alliance with any force fighting against imperialist intervention. Even if, for example, Lalu Prasad Yadav is fighting against uh, imperialist intervention, tactically we'll have to uh, form an alliance with them. But that is only in so far as the imperialist aggression is there, number one. Number two, every imperialist aggression is not for colonization or neo-colonization. So we need, also need to make a distinction between imperialist aggression due to a variety of reasons other than the intent to colonize or neo-colonize a country or uh, uh, make it a, uh, uh, its a, a client state or something like that. There are many possible reasons for imperialist interventions and that is to, is not simply de decided by economic factors and I believe Comrade Eric would agree, agree that it is also determined by a political conjuncture. And in that political conjuncture, the tactical short-term alliance definitely can be four class, but it's not strategic alliance. So, uh, in determining the principal contradiction, we also have to take into account that the fact that it should, it should guide a revolutionary Maoist party to determine the strategic class alliance. So in that sense, uh, I think the whole question of uh, imperialist intervention in Syria should be studied and taken into consideration. Uh, another thing is that uh, there is a point in paper that the contradiction between proletariat and the bourgeoisie cannot be considered to be the principal contradiction between because the proletariat is not uh, organized politically as a class 
which is conscious of its historical role, which has its uh, uh, revolutionary uh, program clear cut under the leadership of a vanguard. If on that basis, the contradiction between proletariat and bourgeoisie is not principle, there can be enumerated dozens of cases where there is an oppressed nationality, but the oppressed nationality is not organized in any meaningful way under the leadership of any uh, party of national liberation, either led by the uh, national bourgeoisie or the communists, but uh, the communists are a diff uh, communist leadership of national liberation is a different thing. But even in India, in Northeast, for example, barring the exception of Manipur and uh, Nagaland, in other northeastern states, the national liberation movement has totally disintegrated. There is no leadership whatsoever. There are small splinter groups totally isolated from the masses. It ha they have no appeal among the uh, masses of these uh, nationally oppressed uh, people. And in some cases, some small communist groups are larger than the national liberation forces. So if we accept that proletariat bourgeoisie contradiction cannot become principle because there is no vanguard force, the class is not organized in the political sense as a class, uh, in terms of Lenin it has not uh, assumed, uh, achieved the class political consciousness, not simply class consciousness, then what about situations like Mizoram or what about situa situations like Arunachal where there is no vanguard of national liberation movement, what is the principal contradiction there? Proletariat, bourgeoisie, it's not because the proletariat is not organized politically as a class under the leadership of a, of a vanguard. But so is the, the national liberation movement. There is no leading force of the national liberation movement and yet it is oppressed nationality. What is the principal contradiction? So I think this method is, uh, it smacks of young Hegelian subjectivism because Mao talked about also talked about the principal aspect of principal contradiction. The contradiction between proletariat and bourgeoisie is principal contradiction in the world today. And we, are, we totally agree with uh, Comrade Eric that uh, the forces of uh, proletariat are much too weak and its weakness is in excess of the weakness of uh, imperialism. It's much more weaker than imperialism. But from this, we cannot say that it is not principal contradiction and it will become principal contradiction only when our forces will become the principal aspect of the principal contradiction. So it is somehow confusing these two concepts uh, because in the world uh, today also, then even if we accept that Syria is a nationally oppressed country, the forces of national liberation are too weak, much too weak than the, imper the, than the imperialist forces that are intervening there. So if the existence of a politically organized class or a nation, oppressed nationality organized for its national liberation under a leadership is the yardstick to determine the principal contradiction, then there is no principal contradiction in the world right now. So I think uh, this should be taken into consideration. Then there is uh, this question of semi-fascism. Uh, it should have been elaborated in a more concrete way because the differentia specifica of fascism is not simply that it is expression of the most reactionary faction of the bourgeoisie in the period of monopoly capitalism. That is given. That is the fundamental contradiction which leads to rise of, rise of fascism. And not in the documents of Comintern or Dimitrov thesis, but in writings of uh, leaders of international proletarian communist movement at that time, we find allusions that it is a reactionary mass movement. It's a reactionary social movement organized in a very systematic way uh, under the leadership of a very organized reactionary bourgeois party, fascist party, often guided by a very specific ideological unity of the fascistic kind. So these three elements are the uh, differentia specifica of fascism and if we just add an ad adjective that semi-fascism 
and it is not a complete project, even then it runs the risk of creating confusion. Moreover, the case of India, maybe, and I won't, I'm not uh, presenting a criticism here, maybe because uh, the situation of India is totally not known to comrades in the US. The case of India is not like a uh, Turkish case or a uh, Philipp Philippine case. I mean, Modi is totally different from Erdogan or uh, Duterte or Trump. Totally different. I mean, qualitatively different, not simply quantitatively different because Modi represents a very systematic, uh, he is a symbol of a very systematic reaction which can be categorized as a fascist reaction because, because behind Modi is stands a fascist party, cadre based fascist party and behind Modi he is not just a, a rabid right wing figure, uh, authoritarian representing an authoritarian government the, and even be, behind Trump there is a movement of petty, there is a spontaneous petty bourgeois romantic support for Trump, but that is not organized. It's more of an spont, more of a spontaneous thing. Behind Erdogan also there is a petty bourgeois movement, but it is not a fascistically organized petty bourgeois movement. So we need to make these little distinctions. Otherwise, uh, this epithet of fascism or semi-fascism can be used very carelessly, and it might create confusion. Secondly. The fact that fascism can exist without, uh, you know, doing away with the shell of bourgeois democracy and the institutions of bourgeois democracy like parliament or free press, though the parliament, uh, it only the shell remains in India. Judiciary, only the shell remains. If one judge attempts independently to probe a leader of the fascist party, Amit Shah, Justice Loya, he's killed. And election commission, one of the most respected pillars of uh, Indian democracy, uh, the long time secretary of Modi is appointed, Modi ka tha na secretary? Uh, long time secretary of Modi when he was CM of Gujarat is appointed the uh, commissioner of uh, election commission and the parliament in India, it uh, how, uh, I mean right now all these democratic processes of bourgeois democracy are compromised in India. Only the shell remains, only the form remains, nothing else remains. So I don't agree with the Tamas who has given a theory of post-fascism because there are many problems with that. But this point is correct about his theory. What he calls post-fascism, there is no need for this prefix post. It is fascism because like socialism, fascism also performs a redemptive activity. They also learn from their history. And if socialism, socialist revolution occurs in India or any country today, the socialist model which will be developed or the socialist path will, which will be developed, definitely it will be guided by the principles and the teachings of GPCR. But everything will not, we won't be able to do everything by just by exegesis. There will be many, many new things, many, many things unexplained and we'll have to use the Maoist method to understand them. And that will lead to new expressions and new forms during the new socialist transition, new socialist revolutions of 21st century. Similarly, I'm just inverting the example, the fascists also learn from their history. Modi doesn't need to introduce an exceptional law like Hitler. He can do everything within the shell of this hollow shell of this bourgeois democracy. And yet it is fa fascism. So the analysis of the fascism should not be formalistic. If we say that uh, bourgeois democracy and the institutions of bourgeois democracy should be demolished in the most apparent fashion and done away with and only then we'll accept that fascism has arrived because that is the problem with many left move, left groups in India, ML groups, Maoist groups who claim that no, no, it's still parliament is there. How can you say that? Yeah, fascism is coming, but it has not arrived. It won't arrive because the whole premise of this analysis is formalism. So that kind of... Uh, Reenactment doesn't happen in history. First time as tragedy, then as farce. So that is why we also need to understand the fact that even reactionary ideologies perform, redeem themselves, learn from history, evolve new strategies, evolve new forms, evolve new expressions to make them their movement more hegemonic. hegemonic. So that is one point which I think uh, also should be given a thought. Secondly, one clarification, uh, 
because I didn't understand that properly maybe. Uh, on page 2, the first line. Recent years have seen a withdrawal of imperialist states to their national borders in order to fortify themselves for the redivision of the world to come. Now, there are a number of possible meanings which I try to derive from this sentence. One is that this withdrawal is referring to the process of decolonization and the direct presence of imperialist powers in the third world countries constituting a state apparatus and administrative apparatus that is gone and maybe that uh, is uh, this sentence is referring to that and if this sentence is referring to that then it, how will be the redivision are they going to recolonize the world uh, or what will happen so just a clarification that what is the meaning of withdrawal I mean the, pres the presence of imperialist can take a variety of forms uh, in the uh, non-imperialist capitalist or pre-capitalist countries. It can take the form of col colony, it can take the form of semi-colony, it can form take the form of neo-colony. Uh, it can take the form of without any colonial, semi-colonial or neo-colonial form. It can take the form of uh, an informal sphere of influence. For example, certain sections of globes globe are divided in certain imperialist powers, though there is no uh, political rule, uh, formal or informal, direct or indirect, but still those countries with are like Portugal, for example, uh, when Lenin talked about Portugal, which let certain imperialist countries use their bases, military bases, which let the US use uh, their, uh, uh, let uh, their fighter planes fuel their fighter planes on their land. A lot of things happen, I mean. So, what is the particular meaning of withdrawal? Second thing, I think there is one place where it has been claimed that the principles of GPCR talk about the mass control of the state. Page number 9. First para, maybe 7th line, I guess. 7th or 8th line. Uh, it says... This class struggle is not simply oriented towards the question of the state, but has as it stakes the contradictions that traverse society between men and women, town and country, manual and intellectual labor and nationalities, starting from GPCR, mass criticism of the party that we agree and mass control of the state. This smacks of Bethlehemite and early Bedou kind of analysis. If I don't know about Bedou properly, but definitely Bethlehem has talked about mass control of state and all. But I don't think this is a Leninist position. Lenin always talked about that the proletarian in the proletarian state, which characterizes the dictatorship of proletariat, the principal instrument of proletarian dictatorship is party. Definitely party presents itself for criticism from below, from among the masses, implements a revolutionary mass line, though Lenin doesn't use that term. But what he means, for example, on workers' inspection, some of the last, some of his last articles, he's actually uh, anticipating the theory of uh, revolutionary mass line. So if we take from that, uh, from those writings of Lenin, even in those writings, uh, this kind of, what kind of mass, you know, I mean, this assumes that the spontaneity of the masses is revolutionary. This will lead to some kind of a spontaneity fetishism. And mass, masses will never control the state as long as there is classes and state. The revolutionary party, uh, during the trade union controversy, the opposition asked uh, that it is the, said that it, it, it blamed the CCN Politburo that actually it is the one party's rule, one party is ruling. Uh, Lenin said, yes, one party is ruling. Does the common worker know how to rule? No. And even in an advanced capitalist country like the US, the common worker doesn't know how to rule. If, for example, socialist revolution happens tomorrow in the US, there will be a need for institutionalized leadership of the party and any phrase like mass control of the state is seriously misleading and it can lead to some kind of anarcho-syndicalist deviation because unless and until we accept that party is the principal instrument of proletarian dictatorship though the party, the teacher must be taught first and party must go to the masses, must remain in the masses in the world of 
words of Lenin, it should absorb the best elements of the proletariat and it should present itself for criticism from below. That should be there. Even then, it is the party which is the uh, uh, instrument of proletarian dictatorship. It, it is the party that controls. And if we oppose this line, it will ultimately, in this or that form, will lead to the logic of pitting the party against the mass or pitting the party against the class, whatever. <laughs> Holds true in the both cases. So this, I think, either uh, uh, the uh, uh, maybe uh, comrade Eric wanted to say something else, but because this uh, uh, phrase is very problematic and troubling. Secondly, uh, there is one place that uh, in the next para, it has been said that uh, indeed the GPCR affirms the primacy of politics over economism and ideologism alike. During the GPCR, the bourgeoisie entrenched in the party and its state was constituted as a political class. It was not the bourgeoisie of monopolists directly extorting surplus value from the working class, but the bourgeoisie defined politically in its antagonistic relation to the proletarian revolution against both revisionists, uh, that, that, that's uh, uh, the basic thing on which I want to talk, because yes, it's true that the state bourgeoisie is basically defined politically and it doesn't extract surplus directly, directly from the working class, but it is the beneficiary as the state officials and party officials of and it has a decision making power and there is an inequality. So we cannot completely de-economize the concept of state bourgeoisie. It's not only politically defined, it's also e political economically defined. So uh, that's how I understood the concept of state bourgeoisie as propounded by Mao. But on the whole, the logic is correct that it is basically decided on the basis of who chooses what role during the socialist transition in the state and in the party, the capitalist roaders and the socialist uh, the communist revolutionaries but it is not simply that we cannot end there or we cannot stop there while defining state bourgeoisie there is a otherwise if we de-economize the cons this concept the GPCR also becomes a cultural thing or just a political thing G it's not just a political thing or just a cultural thing or ideological thing as comrade Eric himself very beautifully described while criticizing Althusser but we also need to understand it was because politics is the concentrated expression of economics in the world's most concentrated expression of economics as Lenin said. And we cannot de-economize these concepts. So I don't agree with Ralph Miliband's critique of the concept of state bourgeoisie. One thing he uh, clearly uh, puts finger on is that how is it decided? Who decided who is a capitalist roader in the party and the state? The masses spontaneously cannot decide. It is the interaction, organic interaction between the party and the masses through the application of revolutionary mass line. But in that interaction, it's a dialectical interaction. It is not as if masses have an upper hand in that interaction. Party learns from the masses and teaches the masses in return. So if it's the party which ultimately decides who is capitalist roader within the party, it becomes a round it, it, this logic goes round and round in a circle. So we also have, need to have a very clear-cut political economy basis of the concept of state bourgeoisie, which uh, sprouts uh, in the party and the uh, state, and it has a clear-cut relationship with the petty commodity, as Lenin said, uh, about the bureaucratic distortion and bourgeois deformities within the uh, communist party and the proletarian state during the socialist transition, that it is navally linked with the petty commodity production which goes on in the society. It is linked with the uh, class struggle and the constant reproduction of capitalist relations due to these petty commodity production. If we don't completely delink it from that, then and it becomes a purely political definition, definition that then it becomes prone to uh, some kind of idealism, some variety of idealism. Another section claims that any new universal uh, uh, new universal uh, increment 
in the uh, communist theory, Marxist theory, will take place only on the basis of successful revolutions. I think that's an that's a uh, that's an overstatement because uh, a lot of failed revolutions, a lot of failed attempts to take power from 1848 to 1871, the short-lived Paris Commune, a lot of failures also gave new general theories new with with the uh, with universal validity to marxism so i i have had to look where it is said but it is said at one place mm, i'm not able to find it right now I'll, Look for it later. Huh? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Only successful proletarian revolution can produce new principles that enrich the world revolutionary process. That we are in the era of the GPCR means that if we restrict ourselves to the bourgeoisie proletariat contradiction in reference to the question of the state. If we forget that it is the masses that make history and that all the contradictions that traverse society must be resolved during the transition to communism, then we will accumulate only weaknesses and defeats. However, while an era of the world revolutionary process does not depend on the continued existence of the revolutionary experiences that give rise to the principles that define it, experiences that fall short of those principles are idle, incapable of articulating the old with the new. So, yeah, then the October cycle, the era of socialist states that spanned the period from 1917 to 1976 and which included both the October Revolution and the GPCR has now been over for more than 40 years, which means that no new universal principles of Marxism have been produced in nearly a half century, which clearly means that only successful experiments can create new universal principles of Marxism, which I think historically is not true. Many unsuccessful revolutions, attempts at seizure of power uh, by the revolutionary forces have enriched Marxism, have enriched Marxism not only quantitatively but also qualitatively. And at one place, though, Comrade Eric said in his elaborations that uh, one should not, one will not uh, ally with the Taliban. But if we claim that supporting a national liberation movement has nothing to do with its internal class structure, that also means if we, it has nothing to do with its internal class structure because class struggle gives rise to ideas, because every ideological struggle is also a class struggle, every, every class struggle is a political struggle as Comrade Eric has quoted in his paper. Uh, if that's true, then this argument that regardless of the internal class structure of any nationality, oppressed nation, we have to support because if the oppressed nationality uh, takes a reactionary position in the overall class struggle going on in the inter international level, there is no reason why shouldn't we support Taliban. We should support Taliban then. And we cannot just say that Taliban uh, is supported by forces which uh, we should try to win over. We also need to explain in what circumstances those forces have been conquered by Talib, Taliban politically. One explanation is lack of alternative, that there is no viable uh, opposition to imperialism. But if we accept this proposition, any force which is fighting against national liberation movement, uh, national oppression, we should support it. Just like the argument that we should support SDF in the context of Kurdish liberation, but the SDF is also there in northern Iraq around Kirkuk fighting for American hegemony there uh, on the oil resources because it's the most rich area in oil resources. Then how do we balance? In Turkey we support FDF, in Syria we support SDF and we in Iraq we oppose it. So uh, th that is one contradiction that I see in this argument and this proposition in general uh, is not uh, correct in my opinion that we sh the communist forces sh should support any na oppressed nation even if it's uh, uh, reactionary its movement is reactionary even then we should then we should have supported the Ukrainian nationalists then we should have supported the 
Georgian nationalists, those who uh, took the sides of Delikin, Kolchak and Randall. Because it's totally unconditional and this logic, the natural corollary of this logic is that the task of national liber liberation is not subordinated to the proletarian revolution rather than has assumed a totally autonomous independence and has been fetishized that we should have to support it unconditionally but the caveat, the Leninist caveat that its interest, this uh, task of this national liberation should be subordinated to the proletarian revolution irrespective of the fact whether there is an existing socialist state or not. So these are some preliminary observations. If uh, other points come in the debate, I'll speak again. But uh, I seek the permission of the presidium to sit in the crowd because uh, for temporarily I resign from the presidium, just in case. Thank you. So I would like to thank Comrade Abina for his comments. Um, I can begin by saying that I completely agree on this question of uh, carrying out a concrete analysis. If I had the pretension of elaborating, fully elaborating a general line, which would be uh, hubris, would be absurd, then I, indeed I would have had to carry out uh, detailed concrete, concrete analysis uh, and provide more than some fugitive indications, descriptive in nature, of the world situation uh, in concrete terms. As far as, um, let's see, where can I begin? There were certain points of confusion that it may be my, the fault of my paper for not being clear. But uh, certainly we do, I do not add, just specifying the principal contradiction is that between imperialism and oppressed nations doesn't mean we support every national liberation struggle. Certainly, uh, uh, we can find with Marx, Lenin, and Mao cases in which they did not. Um, Marx, uh, as I mentioned, did not support the um, aspirations of the Czechs and South Slavs. Lenin opposed uh, Polish uh, aspirations in the 20th century, although Marx and Engels had supported them in the 19th century. China uh, opposed uh, the national liberation struggle in what is now Bangladesh. Um, let me make some general remarks. I'm armed with some quotes. I hope you bear with me as I read them. And I think they'll take care of some of the remarks, and then I'll go through, and maybe you can tell me what is still uh, unclear. So the first uh, point I'd like to talk about is the, the relationship between the question of land and the, the national question. Uh, there's a, I think there's certain leaps here. Uh, another leap is that this how, in, under what circumstance the national question is posed and under what circumstances is it liquidated. But the first I'd like to talk about the land question and the national question and what are the grounds for their dissociation. So I have a quote from Stalin from the national question once again. Quote, he says, Semich refuses to regard the national question as being in essence a peasant question. A man who thinks that the social significance of the national movement lies in the competitive struggle between the bourgeoisies of the different nationalities can regard the national question as, in essence, a peasant question. The essence 
of the national question today, this is important, the essence of the national question today lies in the struggle that the masses of the people of the colonies, independent nationalities, are waging against financial exploitation, against the political enslavement and cultural effacement of those colonies and nationalities by the imperialist bourgeoisie of the ruling nationality. The main point here is not that the bourgeoisie of one nationality is beating or may beat the bourgeoisie of another nationality in a competitive struggle, but that the imperialist group of the ruling nationality is exploiting and oppressing the bulk of the masses, above all the peasant masses, the colonies and dependent nationalities, and that by oppressing and exploiting them it is drawing it into the struggle against imperialism, converting them into allies of the proletarian revolution. So for Stalin, the national question in this in this passage, he says the national question is in essence a peasant question. So the question is, does this mean that the national question is in essence a land question? And as this formulation may seem to apply, no, because the peasant question is not identical with the land question. How does Stalin define the peasant question? In what I just read, he says it's the struggle that the masses of the people of the colonies and dependent nationalities are waging against financial exploitation, political uh, enslavement, and cultural effacement. So the land question poses a, a contradiction, a dialectical unity. The land question poses the, the contradiction, masses and feudalism. Yes. The peasant question, for Stalin, poses a different contradiction. The masses of the people of the colonies and dependent nationalities, and the imperialist bourgeoisie of the ruling nationality. That is, masses of the oppressed nations, imperialist bourgeoisie of the oppressor nation. Nation, imperialism. Okay. Now, uh, the struggle of the masses, then, is, in this account, the struggle of the nation. There's a complex relationship between the people and the nation. The struggle against financial exploitation, political enslavement, and cultural effacement. Imperialism converts the bulk of the masses, particularly the peasant masses, into allies of the proletarian revolution. So here, uh, uh, a caveat. While the broadness of a possible united front is significant, Stalin also, in, in here we can recall that quote from the, uh, from the Chinese Communist Party, that those who refuse to be slaves of imperialism include uh, certain kings and princes. What seems more significant, actually, for Stalin uh, Gonzalo from the Peruvian Communist Party talks about this as well, is the bulk or weight of the masses within a united front, the peasant masses in particular. So the significance of alliances around a popular revolutionary program is double. It's the broadness of alliance or the bulk or weight of the alliance. And for, for Stalin in this quote, he says the bulk of the masses in the colonies and dependent nationalities. So the national struggle is not simply identified with the national bourgeoisie. This point needs to be made. Um, so supporting the, the struggle for Kurdish independence does not necessarily, uh, the, the instrumentalization of the SDF by, the, by US imperialism, which I agree is the case, and I agree it means we don't support the SDF, it doesn't mean that there are not national forces maybe not organized, highly organized, but there, that there are not national forces within the uh, ranks of the Kurdish nation. And we know from Marx that there are only two classes that are capable of constituting themselves as political classes today, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So the question of the bulk of the masses engaged in the struggle, national struggle, 
against national oppression is not uh, reducible to the question of uh, organizations. We don't need to support the Taliban. Um, let's see. On the question of who to ally with, uh, Abhinav, Comrade Abhinav um, talked about uh, this question of, again, not supporting uh, uh, opposing collaborators and su supporting uh, revolutionary elements. And uh, of course, this is, goes without saying. We're not nationalists. I agree completely that we have to always subordinate the national movement to the popular movement, that is, to the movement in the line of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, Lenin, in, uh, at the Second Congress of the Comintern in the fourth session, makes just this point. He says, uh, we debated, this is a quote, we debated whether it is correct in principle and theoretically to declare that the Comintern and the Communist parties have a duty to support the bourgeois democratic movements in the backward countries. And the outcome of this discussion was that we came to the unanimous decision to talk not about the bourgeois democratic movement, but only about the national revolutionary movement. He continues, um, skipping, a certain understanding has emerged between the bourgeoisie of the exploiting countries and that of the colonies, so that very often, even perhaps in most cases, the bourgeoisie of the oppressed countries, although they also support national movements, nevertheless fight against all revolutionary movements and revolutionary classes with a certain degree of agreement with the imperialist bourgeoisie, that is to say, together with it. The point about this is that as communists will only support the bourgeois freedom movements in the colonial countries if these movements are really revolutionary and if their rev representatives are not opposed to us training and organizing the peasantry in a revolutionary way. So he narrows the uh, bourgeois democratic movements that communists might support, those that are revolutionary versus reformist, and those that are, uh, whose representatives are not uh, opposed to communist organizing the peasantry. Um, on the question of conqueror bourgeoisie, Um, it's my understanding that we should understand conqueror bourgeoisie as principally a political distinction and not liquidated into social class. Uh, the, I'm not convinced by the argument that the conqueror bourgeoisie must be a commercial bourgeoisie. That is the argument that Mao makes in analysis of classes in Chinese society in the selected works, but that's a revision of the original version. The original version, uh, the relevant passage, reads as follows. First, the big bourgeoisie. In economically backward and semi-colonial China, the big bourgeoisie is wholly a vassal of the international bourgeoisie, depending entirely on imperialism for its survival and development. For example, the comprador class, the bankers, Lu Zongyu, Chen Yanbo, etc., the businessmen, Tang Xiaoyi, He Dong, etc., the industrialists, Zhang, Zhang Jiang, Sheng and Xi, etc., those that have close relationships with foreign capital the big landlords, the bureaucrats. The, the class of reactionary intellectuals is an appendage of the above four kinds of people. So he defines the comprador as bankers, businessmen, industrialists, and those that have close relationships with foreign capital. He says, that, quote, the class of reactionary intellectuals is an appendage of the above four kinds of people. 
the high-ranking staff of banking, industrial, and commercial enterprises of comparable character, plutocrats, and high-ranking government officials, politicians, part of the students who have studied abroad in Japan and the West, part of the teachers and students from universities and specialized schools, eminent lawyers, and so on, all belong to this category. The goals of this class and those of the National Revolution are absolutely incompatible. From beginning to end, they side with imperialism and are an extreme counter-revolutionary group. It is a deadly enemy within the National Revolutionary Movement. Um, you can also, in this regard, we, we shouldn't simply rely on a definition by Mao refer to, uh, because I think this question, a lot of the differences raised by Comrade Abhinav, which are, are very thought-provoking, and I'm simply presenting my initial thoughts. Um, a lot of them have to do with understanding the space of politics, and particularly the relationship with, between um, class in the political sense and social class, where Abhinav, uh, his assessment is that I'm uh, overly politicist, de-economizing. So this is Marx in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. He says, regarding the petty bourgeoisie, one must not get the narrow-minded notion that on principle they wish to enforce an egoistic class interest. Rather, they believe the special condition of their emancipation are the general conditions within whose frame alone modern society can be saved and class struggles avoided. Just as little must one imagine that the democratic representatives are indeed all shopkeepers or enthusiastic champions of shopkeepers. According to their education and their individual position, they may be as far apart as heaven and earth. What makes them representatives, he means political representatives of the petty bourgeoisie, is the fact that in their minds they do not get beyond the limits which with the latter do not get beyond in life. That they are consequently driven, theoretically, to the same problems and solutions to which the material interest and social position drive the latter practically. This is, in general, the relationship between the political and literary representatives of a class and the class, meaning social class, they represent. So there's a difference here that he's making between the political representatives of the petty bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie itself. We could also refer to class struggles in France, where he talks about the bourgeoisie as a political class, the bourgeois republican fact, uh, faction, versus the bourgeois royalist factions that actually have the support of the bourgeoisie as a social class. Um, one other quote in this regard from the Holy Family. He says, bourgeois society is positively represented by the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie therefore begins its rule. The rights of man cease to exist merely in theory. So Marx articulates, disarticulates rather, the bourgeoisie as a political class. They're the Jacobins and bourgeois uh, society. So when it comes to the question of forming class alliances, you mentioned Arunachal Pradesh and what, what, no, Mizoram. We don't have to wait for a national liberation movement to be organized politically. Uh, and in this respect, I don't agree on this author with everything or very much even, but we can draw on Poulantzis' understanding of political class, or of, I'm sorry, of class as a social force in a determined formation. Um, it can be said that, in this sense, class as a social force exists when the relation to relations of production is reflected on other levels by what he calls pertinent effects on the political and ideological structures. Uh, and uh, he talks about Marx on the smallholding peasantry. He says, Marx expressly acknowledges on several occasions the existence in the concrete conjuncture of Bonapartism of smallholding peasants as a distinct class, although they possessed in the Second Empire neither a political organization of their own nor an ideology of their own. 
They constitute precisely a distinct class to the extent that their place in the process of production is reflected in this concrete conjuncture at the level of political structures by the historical phenomenon of Bonapartism, which would not have existed without the small peasant farmers. Bonapartism constitutes the small holding peasants as a distinct class, that is, as a social force in this formation. It is important to recognize clearly that the existence of a class in a formation presupposes its existence at the political level through pertinent effects, which do not, however, need to extend to its having its own political organization, strictly speaking, or constituting its own class ideology. Uh, so, as far as forming class alliances, um, this, together with the Stalin quote, uh, I'm suggesting that what generally, as a strategic orientation, ideological and strategic political orientation, is that uh, there have to be alliances formed with the bulk of the masses who are fighting the national struggle. And we cannot identify the national struggle simply with the organizations uh, of the national bourgeoisie. It doesn't mean that I'm denying the existence of a national bourgeoisie, which, uh, like Comprador, I'm defining politically. Um, what other points here? GPCR. Um, uh, okay, well, there was one point that was, I think, not understood which was this point about failed and successful revolutions. I was perhaps not clear enough. The, the point that I was making there is not that no failed revolutions have taught us anything. In fact, all of the events and the history of the revolutionary process have been failures, astonishing failures, from the Paris Commune to the Russian sequence, Chinese sequence, but that after these milestones, the Paris Commune, the October Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, certain principles, universal principles, are established. And if one ignores those principles, for example, regarding one universal principle, is that of the need for the dictatorship of the proletariat. That's not established. It was established through practice. Marx went back and revised the Communist Manifesto decades later in light of experience, in light of drawing a summation of experience, of revolutionary political experience. And so from then on, any attempt at revolution that does not, uh, that is not in the line of the dictatorship of the proletariat is idle, is sterile. This is what I meant. So it's not that there are no historical failures that have produced principles, it's that once a principle has been established, anything that falls short of that principle is sterile from the perspective of universal principles. It doesn't mean we cannot draw lessons of various kinds, but they, they won't be universals on, in the way that the dictatorship of the proletariat, the vanguard party, uh, the class masses dialectic, uh, our principles. Uh, as far as the, uh, with Conrad Abinov uh, talked about the bourgeoisie should not be unilaterally defined politically, uh, I agree. Um, I, perhaps I stated it too strongly, but it should be the principal aspect, uh, definitely. We should understand the bourgeoisie principally as that force which organizes the counter-revolution, that is, that blocks the revolutionary process. Um, on the question of 1963, I do not agree, I, I certainly do not think that we should transpose the line of 1963. I think we have a diff very different task today, the task of growing our subjective forces uh, is, was not the task at that time. I think, uh, as I said in the paper, that the main trend today is uh, towards violence, imperialism, imperialist violence and reaction along the line. Uh, 
At that time, the trend was the revolutionary trend, and this imposes the, uh, different uh, tasks. After in 1963, the U.S. was uh, hegemonic. Soviet social imper imperialism was emerging, but but weak. And so the task was an anti-U.S. anti-hegemonic alliance of forces opposed to uh, U.S. imperialism. In this paper, I argued for something very different, that we count on our own forces, and that we oppose U.S. imperialism, Russian imperialism, imperialism of Europe, China, and so forth alike. Um, is there anything else I didn't know? Uh, the question of uh, fashion. Okay. So two two things. So first, uh, uh, finishing with the GPCR, this question of mass control of the state. I think we have to distinguish the state and the party. Uh, I find that I I have, would have to <laughs> study this idea more, or ask uh, Comrade Abinov or others what this means. But the institutionalized leading role of the party. It seems problematic insofar as the state. I mean, one of the lessons, positive lessons from the GPCR, maybe the central lesson, is that the state does not dis extinguish itself. It requires mass activity. That's not. That's, it's, it's not leading. Uh, I don't think there's a slippery slope to uh, um, to anarchism there. This is a basic to Maoism. The party has a leadership role. It leads the broad masses in the destruction of the state. That's the passage to communism. It will take many turns. There'll be retreats and failures. But that should be the broad movement of history. This is the negative summation of the Russian sequence and also of the failure of the, pro the great proletarian cultural revolution. So, I mean, history did not stop with Lenin. So I'm not convinced by simply invoking that in there. I think we should also be, always be clear to understand the dictatorship of the proletariat is the party leading the masses and seizing their own power. The slogan of workers' power is a Trotskyist slogan. Uh, I think another point at which uh, Comrade Abhinav and I may disagree in this respect is on the question of the commune state, which was raised by the Maoist center at the time of the Cultural Revolution. There were even extensive articles published in Redmond Rudau and Red Flag on the Paris Commune at that time for that reason. On the question of fascism, I don't want to, I don't have, I'm not capable of carrying out a concrete analysis of the situation here in India right now. I think this is a tricky question because we have this historical phenomenon of classical fascism and the question is what is contingent and merely formal and what is essential when we apply the term today. And it seems to me that this trend, we'll just call it a rightward trend, far right trend, on a global scale is characterized by uh, the various features that I, that I mentioned, but it, it attempts, attempts to uh, impose hegemony by a backward section of the, the reactionary section, rather, of the bourgeoisie through executive means rather than parliamentary means. Uh, I think the achievement of fascism in some in some way has to depend on the abolition of the parliamentary state. I will take any further comments, and if there's anything obvious enough that I have not addressed, okay.
One, uh, the first point that Comrade Eric raised, it's totally clear that national question, the difference between national question and peasant question, the difference between peasant question and land question. My question was that if we are accepting, I'm just restating the question, <coughs> if we accept that semi-feudal and feudal relations were done away with, for example, in Syria. Who did it? That was my question. So the question was basically, who carried out that task? If Assad is comprador, who carried out that task in Syria? That was the basic question. I, we are not conflating the two questions, I mean national question and peasant question. That is very much clear. But the point is, in your paper it has been said that the national question has nothing to do with semi-feudal feudal relations as such. And if it is accepted that in third world countries or relatively backward countries, uh, let's not say whether they are capitalist or pre-capitalist, but if semi-feudal and feudal relations are done away with, there must have been some agent to do that. We cannot say that imperialism did it from above or from outside. There must be some agent within Syria who carried those reforms or who carried that transformation, even not reforms, that transformation from feudal or semi-feudal relations to uh, capitalist relations. So that was my question. कि और क्योंकि अब सारी बातें दोहराई जाएंगी वही सवाल दोबारा आएंगे मैं हिंदी में बता दे रहा हूं आई एम जस्ट वेरी ट्रांसलेटिंग फॉर कॉमरेड्स बिकॉज़ देयर इज अ ग्रोइंग डिसकंटेंट देयर कैन बी अ रेवोल्यूशनरी ओवरथ्रो राइट हियर राइट नाउ सो अ नेशनल लिंग्विस्टिक नेशनल ओवरथ्रो सो तो इसलिए ये क्या बोलते हैं कि ये सवाल था मेरा कि पेपर में स्वीकार किया गया है कि जो तमाम तीसरी दुनिया के देश हैं उनमें सामंती या अर्ध सामंती संबंध नहीं रहे लेकिन साथ में जो पूरे विषय का पर बात रखी गई है उससे ये साफ तौर पे स्पष्ट हो के आया है कि आज सीरिया में फॉर एग्जांपल असद जो है वो दलाल बुर्जुआ जी है तो असद अगर दलाल है और सीरिया में अर्ध सामंती और सामंती संबंध हटा दिए गए किसने हटाया अगर बात पार्टी दलाल है तो वो किसी ने कुछ किया होगा तभी तो खत्म हुए सामंती और अर्थ सामंती संबंध तो यहां पर एक अंतर विरोध है सो द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज दैट देर इज अ कॉन्ट्रडिक्शन इन द पोजीशन ऑफ द पेपर दैट द फ्यूडल एंड सेमी फ्यूडल रिलेशंस आर नॉट देयर एंड असद इट्स नॉट अबाउट असद असद हैज नॉट बीन मेंशन बट द ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ द सीरियन क्वेश्चन इट इट इज क्लियर दैट द असद रेजीम इज अ कॉम्प्रेडोर ऑफ रशियन इंपीरियलिज्म so if he is comprador what did bad party to his father and now this guy how the semi feudal relations were done away with that was my question so the difference between the national question and peasant question on the one hand and peasant question and land question on the other are clear ha bhai sir acha acha The second thing uh, that was raised here, the national struggle cannot simply be reduced to national bourgeoisie. So the question arises that what kind of class alliance will be formed if there is no national bourgeoisie? That means in rural areas there is no rich peasantry, non-comparable. There is no rich peasantry, there is no uh small industrialist small shopkeeper type class in the urban areas 
so the alliance in this national liberation revolution will consist of what classes how many classes four classes three classes so if the this general proposition doesn't tell us about the actual concrete nature of the class uh, alliance strategic class alliance not tactical for example in syria tactically maybe one can ally with any any force at all which is fighting against both imperialism the us imperialism and the russian imperialism but that alliance on the basis of the on the basis of the uh, concrete class struggle of syrian society class structure of syrian syrian society can only be a tactical class alliance a short term tactical class alliance not a, not a strategic class alliance and with this i link the question if we accept that national oppression versus imperialism is the principal contradiction in the world revolutionary process today then we need we, it, the natural outcome of this argument will be a four class alliance right now i am leaving the question whether the national liberation forces are organized under any organization or not i am totally leaving that out right now i'll come to that later but the first question is even if there is no national liberation organization under the leadership of which the classes are fighting we need to tell which classes are fighting against this national oppression what are those classes so that was the second question that i raised that is totally acceptable that national liberation that's why the that was the whole basis of the theory of worker peasant alliance regarding the stage of national liberation movements that's totally understandable even in that case it was a four class alliance because there was a class which could be uh, considered as a national bourgeoisie even if not in the sense of some factory owners or something like that even then there was a four class alliance not three class alliance <coughs> then my i also don't think that if in mizoram and arunachal pradesh there is no organized nationalist leadership we should not support the national uh, anti national oppression movement that was not my my question was that if on the basis of the fact that in the contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie the proletarian leadership or proletarian organization is so weak that it cannot become the principal contradiction then in the case of national liberation movements if that movement is not politically organized why can we consider that as a principal contradiction because in the paper being or the question of proletariat being organized in the political sense is one of the basis of considering the contradiction between the proletariat and bourgeoisie as principal contradiction if we accept that bourgeoisie and proletariat contradiction is not principal contradiction because the proletarian forces are not class politically organized then in that was my question in the case of arunachal pradesh and mizoram where the national liberation movement is not politically organized why should we consider it as a principal contradiction while i we totally accept that even if that is the whole point that that, that is the logic that i am putting forward even if there is no national leadership at the level of arunachal and at the level of mizoram national oppression is principal contradiction even if it is not organized politically under the leadership of a party representing the national liberation movement but at when we talk about the world revolutionary process then it's a whole totally different thing so the the question was not that uh, we should not support mizoram uh, uh, people's movement against the national repression by the national oppression by the indian state we are supporting actually in practice we are i mean we totally support these movements of oppressed nationality actually in practice not only theoretically we actually in practice support these movements the point that i was trying to make is that the bourgeoisie the logic on the basis of which you have denied this status to status of principal contradiction to proletariat and bourgeoisie contradiction that basis apply this if this we apply the same method to the question of national oppression then even national oppression won't be principal contradiction in the context of mizoram and arunachal 
दैट वॉज द लॉजिक इसको मैं हिंदी में बता दे रहा हूं पेपर में यह बात आई थी कि भाई आज पूंजीपति वर्ग और बुर्जुआ क्या बोलते हैं मजदूर वर्ग के अंतर्विरोध को प्रधान अंतर्विरोध इसलिए नहीं माना जा सकता क्योंकि आज दुनिया के स्तर पर सरहारा वर्ग की ताकतें वर्ग राजनीतिक रूप से संगठित नहीं है वर्ग के संगठन का कई मंदिर होता है अपने आप में क्लास अपने लिए क्लास और अपने लिए राजनीतिक तौर पर राजनीतिक तौर पर अपने लिए क्लास जिसको लेनिन ने कहा कि वर्ग चेतना तो प्राप्त कर लेता है मजदूर भूजीवादी समाज में अपने अनुभव से और वो क्लास पॉलिटिक्स से बन जाता है लेकिन क्लास पॉलिटिकल कॉन्शियसनेस उसके पास जो है वो अपने वर्ग संगठन के साथ आती है जब वो राज्य सत्ता पे कब्जा करने की जरूरत महसूस कर लेता है तो अगर हम पेपर का लॉजिक ये है कि जब तक सरहारा वर्ग के पास वर्ग राजनीतिक चेतना नहीं होगी तब तक सरहारा वर्ग और बुर्जुआ वर्ग का अंतर्विरोध प्रधान नहीं माना जाएगा ये लॉजिक है तो मेरा इस पर प्रश्न ये था कि अगर ये तर्क सही है तो उन सभी राष्ट्रीय रूप से दमित राष्ट्रीयताओं के आंदोलन जिनके पास कोई नेतृत्व नहीं है और जो संगठित नहीं है उन्हें भी इस प्रधान अंतर विरोध नहीं माना जाना चाहिए तो मेरा कहना यह था कि एक युवा हेगेलीय आदर्शवाद है जो सब्जेक्टिविज्म की एक इसमें वो है कि अगर हमारी फोर्सेज ऑर्गेनाइज नहीं है तो हमारा पूंजीपति वर्ग के साथ कॉन्ट्रोडिक्शन प्रिंसिपल नहीं है यह लॉजिक ही गलत है तो माई बेसिक पॉइंट वॉज दैट दिस होल लॉजिक is subjective is that if our aspect uh, our means proletariat proletariat aspect in the principal contradiction our principal contradiction with bourgeoisie is not the dominant aspect then it's not principal contradiction this whole logic is subjective is logic that was my basic criticism so that, in my opinion this doesn't form any basis of determining principal contradiction whether proletariat uh, has organized itself under under the leadership of a vanguard in the political sense that means he has organized himself as a class in the political sense only then we will consider that it's a principal contradiction then the same logic applied to the national liberation movements can lead to the conclusion that for example in arunachal and mizoram national oppression is not principal contradiction that was the basic question that i raised Now these two statements, in my opinion, are, opinion are contradictory. If you accept Lenin's proposition that those national liberation forces who are actually revolutionary, not anti-communist and reformist, only those national liberation movements should be supported, then actually you are taking into consideration the internal class structure because internal class structure should also not be taken socially; it should be taken politically. so the international internal class structure of the oppressed nationality taken politically includes whether its leadership is anti revolutionary reformist or anti communist or not if we take the internal class structure of the nation in the political sense secondly about the comprador bourgeoisie uh, one is the fact that that article was revised by the revisionists later about the class analysis of chinese society who you said that the original draft of <laughs> then if we don't know whether it was revised by mao himself then it is uh, taking mao's early stand or later stand you if it was revised by mao's mao himself then we take the later mao's position correct and i think we should take the last word of the great uh, proletarian leader in given certain conditions we can also reject that and take the earlier view of mao that's okay but the quote that you gave it talked about big bourgeoisie commercial big bureaucratic bourgeoisie i mean commercial bureaucratic bourgeoisie can be big but the uh, examples that you that Uh, which that uh, quote enumerated certain names i don't know the name of the people who mao mentions in the earlier draft of the article but it says big bourgeoisie so i'm not sure whether he's actually talking about the industrial character of the bourgeoisie secondly a small industrialist producing intermediate products can be part of comprador bourgeoisie that's true but 
is the Syrian bourgeoisie like that or is the Indian bourgeoisie like that or is the Filipino bourgeoisie like that which is only producing intermediate products or producing raw materials in the industries, small industries, uh, not finished products for final consumption. They can be part of Comprador. There are many, many examples in which the Comprador bourgeoisie comprised of some elements of industrial bourgeoisie who were, who were kind of an ancillary to the metropolitan industry or the industry of the international finance capital. Imperialist finance capital, sorry, there is no unified international finance capital, but uh, that can be, but so is this, uh, I, I would uh, love to read the quote uh, uh, and see whether, I mean, what does he mean by big bourgeoisie, whether he means that it's an industrial bourgeoisie or there are certain elements of industrial bourgeoisie, small industries, who are only producing, so those examples should also be probed, the examples that uh, Mao gives. If it's just big bourgeoisie, that doesn't mean that it's not commercial and bureaucratic, mainly, in the main. Even the most commercial and most bureaucratic bourgeoisie will have some industrial element. It's, it has never happened like that in history. So the dominant character should be decided, because from the, and if Mao says that a bourgeoisie which is predominantly industrial and financial is comprador. We should have the courage to differ from Mao. Because industrial financial bourgeoisie needs markets. It needs it, it has its own expansionary logic. It has entered the stage of real subsumption of labor, expanded reproduction. How can an industrial a bourgeoisie which is predominantly we have to explain this from the basics of Marxist political economy? How can, because political positions are not simply assumed, because the quote you gave from Marx, uh, from 18 Brumaire, he's talking about representatives of a class, not the entire class. And representatives of class take positions, political positions, and their taking political positions have an autonomy and a, it has a difference from the status of class as a social class. That's true. That's totally agreed. And I might have misconveyed, I totally agree with the differentiation that not only Marx, Lenin also has made between the class as a political class and class as a social class. There is no disagreement on that point. But it's, we, I was talking about the class, not certain representatives of the class. So in that sense, if we are talking about the entire class, we cannot be, what you said, excessively politicalistic. We have to also link it with the with its socio-economic roots and why due to mediations of various historical factors various uh, other than economic factors which shape its political position and why a certain kind of autonomy is there in the political position in their political position that is totally agreed So that uh, the quotes which showed that a class can exist without a social class can exist without its political leadership or political organization. That's true. That is the case uh, with uh, many uh, oppressed nationalities and its masses. There is no political representative there, but still there are oppressed nationalities. Totally agree with that. But those were those were not my question. Totally agree that alliances with the national liberation movement must be formed. Even for example, in India, we believe it's the stage of a new socialist revolution. And still we believe that we have to form alliances with the uh, national liberation movement of, of all the oppressed nationalities of India, including Kashmir, northeastern states and all. And only then the socialist revolution can succeed in India. Without that, it is difficult. Uh, uh, it was an overstatement. But yes, it would be difficult for the socialist revolution in India to succeed without allying with the different national liberation movements. Because there is, in my opinion, I am just loud thinking, I might be wrong. Though it's the political duty as a communist revolutionary organization to support all the national liberation movements 
their right to national self determination with including uh, the right to secede the objective situation from early 20th century has changed the russian revolution could not have succeeded without taking a political position based on the political conjuncture of russia of that time on two questions national question and peasant question it took a very politically determined position on these two questions and only then bolshevik revolution succeeded now there is a objectively speaking it doesn't have anything to do with our duty as a revolutionary communist to support and ally with national liberation movements but objectively historically speaking now it can be said that the national liberation movements of the oppressed nationalities in india they cannot succeed if they do not do not ally with the socialist revolution so the need needy part has been exchanged objectively historically having said that the leninist theory of national self data supporting national self determination and uh, including the right to secession is totally unconditional <gasps> under the interest of the world proletarian revolution if it's congruent with that there there are no conditions for our support to national liberation movements under that caveat so you clarified about uh, failed and successful revolution uh, we can discuss it's a minor thing we can discuss it informally but the uh, passage conveyed that meaning that's why i raised the question uh state goods with the question is also resolved because you clarified the, that point yeah this i didn't mean to say that uh, you are copying the tasks from the 63 general line i said that you are deducing not copying deducing today's task your point of reference is 63 general line of 63 that was what i wanted to say and our position is that that point of reference is now outdated it we need to go beyond that so i did because in this we are in 100% uh, agreement we have written it time, uh, time and again in our uh, journals and our organs that the principal task of the communist revolutionary forces today is in uh, increasing our subjective force building the party that is the principal and party building for us is the principal aspect and it is and we already know from our discussions previous discussions that we agree on this point that we believe that party building is the uh, principal task of today so on that we totally agree and we and counting on our own forces not taking the sami ramian position of supporting one imperialism against the other imperialism that is totally regressive position that two point we are in total agreement but i was uh, just referring to the fact that the 63 general line we need to think whether it applies today or not on this uh, it's not a point of debate we just disagree that we still think that and even mao wo disha sanan ka first issue hai even mao said that uh, party's leadership institutionalized leadership we have quoted that uh, section of mao where mao talks about the not only the ideological leading role of the party or ideological political in the very concrete sense that it should have an institutionalized leadership and a state should be subordinated because what is party then we go to that question what is party what is a proletarian party so that is the basic question so <clears throat> we might disagree on that that's okay and on one question from our previous discussion itself we know that we disagree that uh, uh, the latter phase of cultural revolution we had a discussion about it in back in the us that uh, we think that the party principle was being compromised because gpcr the practice of gpcr was uh, delayed it should have started earlier and due to that delay the way in which the practice happened it was like opening a flood gate many things which should not have been compromised in the process were being compromised 
first volume ini i i that first volume of our organ where we have quoted mao that institutionalized leadership is necessary oh that volume is not out of print so i thought maybe what copy was available here but it's not we'll uh, show you so in that sense we differ that we think that the party principle needed to be restored uh, i mean not restored i mean it needed to be what should be the appropriate english word it needed to be reestablished and reinforced because in the process of the practice of gpcr it was actually compromised and it was not some steps backward after in the latter phase 7172 uh, after 7172 uh we think that uh the shanghai commune incident for example or and small incidents like that many incidents happened in that mao's position was correct to contain them and save the party principle <coughs> so on the question of party we have a slightly different uh approach yeah on the question of fascism also i mean we just disagree that uh, we think that fascism in its 21st century uh uh reincarnation is not uh bound or obliged to do away with the parliamentary form because the parliamentary form bourgeois parliamentary form itself has undergone change with the increasing monopolization increasing reactionary nature of the bourgeoisie so in 1930 weimar republic the parliament of weimar republic was really a hurdle in building a fascist state in 21st century in such a parasitic in the period of such a parasitic moribund much more parasitic much more moribund imperialism the parliamentary form itself has been has degenerated to such an extent that there is no need so parliamentary form itself should not be taken as a static thing rather it should we should also see how it has evolved in one maybe 100 year, in a last one century so that also needs to be taken into account and main hindi mein isko bol deta hu abhi tak jo bola ki ek sawal kuch sawalon ko sawal matlab convey nahi hue shayad to is wajah se जो बातें रखी गई उसमें कुछ चीजों पे हम लोग का सहमति है कि वर्ग एक राजनीतिक तौर पे एरिक का कहना है कि वर्ग खुद वर्ग राजनीतिक तौर पे और वर्ग सामाजिक तौर पे सामाजिक तौर पे जो वर्ग है वो उत्पादन संबंधों के निर्धार से सीधे सीधे निर्धारित हो जाता है और उस तौर पे वो अपने आप में वर्ग के रूप में अस्तित्व में आ जाता है चाहे वो राजनीतिक तौर पर संगठित हो या ना हो उसकी कोई पोलिटिकल लीडरशिप हो या ना हो सामाजिक तौर पर वो क्लास होता है लेकिन राजनीतिक तौर पे क्लास होना एक अलग चीज है और जब किसी वर्ग के प्रतिनिधि जो है वो निश्चित राजनीतिक फैसले लेते हैं निश्चित राजनीतिक कदम उठाते हैं निश्चित किस्म के राजनीतिक संगठन बनाते हैं तो वो उस वर्ग के सामाजिक तौर पर वर्ग होने से सीधे सीधे निर्धारित नहीं होता है उसके राजनीतिक अवस्थितियां अपनाने की प्रक्रिया की अपनी एक स्वायत्तता होती है तो वो उस पर तो हम पूरी तरीके से सहमत है सवाल लेकिन वो था नहीं सवाल ये था कि पूरे वर्ग को हम ये नहीं कह सकते हैं इकट्ठे किसी वर्ग के प्रतिनिधियों को कह सकते हैं कि उन प्रतिनिधियों ने जो अवस्थितियां अपनाई उसके उस सामाजिक वर्ग के आकांक्षाओं कलेक्टिव आकांक्षाओं से वो कुछ एक अटोनमी हो सकती है लेकिन पूरा वर्ग स्वायत्त हो जाएगा किससे अपने से तो नहीं होगा खुद ही से तो स्वायत्त नहीं हो जाएगा पूरा वर्ग की बात अगर की जाए तो पूरे वर्ग के अगर राजनीतिक तौर पे संगठित होने की बात की जाए तो उसकी हम लोग बात कर रहे थे इसमें फर्क होता है पॉलिटिकल क्लास एज अ सोशल क्लास और क्लास एज अ पॉलिटिकल क्लास इसमें कोई डिसएग्रीमेंट नहीं है वी टोटली अग्री और जो वो सवाल भी था कि एल किसके साथ करे तो बिल्कुल एल तो अगर कोई राष्ट्रीय आंदोलन का कोई नेतृत्व नहीं भी होगा तो भी हम उस अगर कोई दमित राष्ट्रीयता का आंदोलन है दमित राष्ट्रीयता के किसी आंदोलन का मान लीजिए कि उसका राष्ट्रीय मुक्ति आंदोलन का कोई राजनीतिक नेतृत्व नहीं है तो उस सूरत में भी हम उसको एल तो करेंगे ही उसका समर्थन करेंगे लेकिन घूम फिर के बाद क्लास अलायंस पे आए कि क्लास अलायंस किस किस्म का बनेगा अगर सीरिया में हम आज कहते हैं तो एक टैक्टिकल शॉर्ट टर्म अलायंस वहां पे ऐसे किसी भी फोर्स से बन सकता है जो यूएस एग्रेशन और रशियन इंपीरियलिज्म दोनों के खिलाफ लड़ने को तैयार है चाहे वो वहां का लालू प्रसाद यादव क्यों ना हो कोई लेकिन 
या जो भी मतलब मैं लालू प्रसाद यादव इसलिए कह रहा हूँ क्योंकि लालू प्रसाद यादव एकमात्र पूंजीवादी राजनीति के है जिसने आर के साथ समझौता नहीं किया बहुत कमीना है इसमें कोई वो नहीं है लेकिन वो ये तो फैक्ट है मतलब कि उसने फांसीवाद के साथ समझौता नहीं किया मान लीजिए कि इसलिए मैं मेरे लिए कोई रिप्रेजेंटेटिव एग्जाम्पल है तो मान लीजिए वहां का कोई वैसा फोर्स है तो रशियन एग्रेशन और यूएस एग्रेशन के खिलाफ उससे लड़ने के लिए हम एलाई कर सकते हैं लेकिन आ, वो टैक्टिकल अलायंस होगा टैक्टिकल क्लास वो स्ट्रेटेजिक क्लास अलायंस नहीं होगा और प्रिंसिपल कॉन्ट्रोडिक्शन का अगर स्ट्रेटेजिक क्लास अलायंस एक स्टेज में नहीं बताता है तो वो नहीं आ, उसको वो किया जा सकता देर वॉज वन थिंग दैट आई फॉर गॉट टू मैंशन दैट about uh, fundamental contradiction and principal contradiction in on contradiction mao says the fundamental contradiction in the process of development of a thing and the essence of the process determined by this fundamental contradiction will not disappear until the process is completed but in a lengthy process the conditions usually differ at each each stage the reason is that Although the 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 nature of 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 fundamental contradiction in the process of development of a thing and the essence of the process remain unchanged, the fundamental contradiction becomes more and more intensified as it passes from one stage to another in the lengthy process. In addition, among the numerous major and minor contradiction which are determined or influenced by the fundamental contradiction, some become intensified, some are temporary. some are temporary and temporarily and partially resolved or mitigated and some new ones emerge hence the process is marked by stages if people do not pay attention to the stages in the process of development of a thing they cannot deal with it with its contradiction properly so the fundamental contradiction in the age of imperialism globally is between proletariat and bourgeoisie but the question Uh, in the period of imperialism the question of national oppression and national liberation becomes a part of proletarian revolution and it ceases to be a part of bourgeois democratic project and that constitutes the uh, in the period of uh, mao for example that constituted the principal contradiction that was the stage of the process so are we in the same stage for the last 54 years or the stage has changed the stages uh, have we progressed from the previous stage of the process in last 54 years or not that is a very important question then again this uh, uh, thing has been captured uh, in a very good way in this paper what is a principal contradiction which uh, enables us to progress in the direction of uh, resolution of fundamental contradiction in the given political conjuncture that constitutes the principal contradiction so what is that the uh, the dispute is uh, about what is that principal contradiction as far as the world revolutionary process is concerned so is the world revolutionary process is in the same place as a static thing in 1963 or has it moved some steps in last 54 years thank you ब्रीफली I'll begin with the last uh, point comrade Abinov made. It, to art to specify the principal contradiction as that between oppressed nations and imperialism is not it, it, it's a leap to say that that means that uh what is arguing that nothing has changed in 50 years. The specification in the paper was made on the basis of an assessment of proletarian forces in the conjuncture which is an assessment that would have been very different 50 years ago so the question is how to strengthen our subjective forces that is how to form alliances to grow the proletarian pull 
as the Chinese Communist Party did in the 20s in its alliance with the KMT. Not too much can be drawn from that very different situation, but nonetheless. In uh, the paper, the Mazdur Bigul paper on the same topic, it was stated that the principal contradiction is capital labor. Okay. <laughs> then my point is maybe not. But if we. Uh, okay. Not. The fundamental contradiction, in my view, still has to be proletariat bourgeoisie and not capital labor, because it's proletariat bourgeoisie that uh, defines the revolutionary process on a world scale, not capital labor. And I think if we start with capital labor, we have an economist analysis as a point of departure that's more concerned with relations of exploitation than political relations, uh, and what other social classes want within society, which is the political question. And it will lead to directives that concern labor and wages, economic demands, but it will also uh, dissolve the proletariat in its particular role of leadership. Taken to its limit, it can argue the conservative interests of the labor aristocracy or the bourgeoisie to crush the ideas of the rebellious masses. So there's this danger when we uh, uh, specify the fundamental contradiction as capital labor of political abdication. Of the world revolutionary process, the principal contradiction has been stipulated as being between proletariat and bourgeois. Okay, okay. Well, then I'll move on to the next. Maybe we don't have a difference there. Sounds like we don't. On the question of strategic class alliance, um, I think we should again not. There will be. I believe in these situations a national bourgeoisie in the political sense. The question of a block of how many classes will vary according to the particular internal situation. If we're in Catalonia, it's not going to include peasantry. In Syria, it may. In Scotland, it won't. It will vary uh, situation to situation. And I think it should also be said that uh, we shouldn't reduce uh, this question of uh, the, the national question itself, I think, should not be reduced simply to national liberation struggles. So something like the, uh, it was mentioned in the paper on Latin America, the Cochabamba Water War of 2000 involved protests and strikes and roadblocks against privatization of a municipal water system by a U.S. company, Bechtel, following a 1998 agreement with the IMF to privatize all remaining public enterprises. This has a national character. Alliances can be formed around such struggles. Alliances can be formed around something like the Zapatista uprising, whatever we think of the Zapatistas, not much, which was uh, a struggle against NAFTA's cancellation of an article in the Mexican Constitution that protected indigenous land holdings from sale or privatization. It had a national character. The Venezuelan Caracaso in 1989 <laughs> involved hundreds of deaths, street fighting against the IMF economic package. These struggles can have a national character. In, in the case of Puerto Rico, a colony of the United States, there are struggles around debt, there are struggles around the U.S. military base in Vieques, there is struggles around the handling of the recent hurricane that have a national character. The masses are struggling all over the world 
in, in, so it takes different forms. It's not simply a question of not meaning Syria. It's clear, a clear question of uh, opposing the two imperialisms directly because there's an armed confrontation. This indirect in Lebanon. It's clear. You have Lebanon uh, at the mercy of uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Saudi Arabia linked to the U.S. bloc, Iran linked to the Sino-Russian axis. Prime Minister was just kidnapped. That's a new minimal level of independence. Um, regarding the Mao quote, let me find it. Uh, so Mao says the big bourgeoisie and he says for example the comprador class and he enumerates the comprador class as bankers businessmen industrialists big landlords bureaucrats and reactionary intellectuals and he defines them politically in terms of their goals. He says the goals of this class and those of the National Revolution are absolutely incompatible. So again, uh, in, 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 we can, in this, uh, from the beginning to end, they side with imperialism in our extreme counter-revolutionary group. Lenin's uh, characterization that I read out earlier um, he also defines, uh, it says, politically, uh, the bourgeoisie will often side with imperialism. That doesn't liquidate the national struggle or the national question. Uh, there still is a national revolutionary movement that is subordinated, of course, to the proletarian movement. As far as who did, uh, how semi-feudal relations were transformed in Syria, I'm not going to guess an analysis right now. Although if I were to guess such an analysis, I would say that I, I wouldn't say that the Syrian bourgeoisie was a comparator of bourgeoisie in the 1970s. It seems like there was a national, clearly was a national project actually. The Ba'ath Party in both Iraq and Syria did not uh, constitute a comparator of forces. We agree on social class and political class. Uh, on the question of the GPCR, uh, in the view of my organization, um, the mass rebellions during the GPCR strengthened the dictatorship of the proletariat. They reinforced the party bureaucratic bourgeoisie, a new bureaucratic bourgeoisie, monopoly bourgeois, bureaucratic bourgeoisie emerges within the party. There are mass rebellions on the basis of uh, the objective facts and the revolutionary experience we synthesize lessons. It seems to me clear that in the 1970s proletarian forces found themselves in an increasingly poor position. So the question is what was the sequence that led to the failure of the GPCR and the restoration of capitalism in China in 1976? Um, I find the explanation that it was simply a coup to be unconvincing. Not that that's what Comrade Abhinav put forward. Uh, regarding the question of, again, whether I guess I addressed that. I think that there's something I didn't address. I'll leave it for now. Abhinav.
पहले मैं बता देता हूँ कि एरिक में क्या बोला ये बोल रहे एरिक का मैं हिंदी में वैसे पिछली बार मैंने जो बताया था उसमें एरिक का शामिल था जो मैं अपना बता रहा था साथ में एरिक का भी बता रहा था फिर मैं इस बार भी एरिक का बता दे रहा हूँ एरिक पीपल वॉन्ट मी टू ट्रांसलेट योर रिजॉइंडर लास्ट टाइम आई डेट माई आंसर एज वेल एज योर क्वेश्चन बहुत थोड़े ट्रांसलेटेड बाई मी लास्ट टाइम जस्ट बिफोर दिस सो या एरिक ने बोला कि कि जो असेसमेंट हमने किया है पेपर में वो आज के राजनीतिक संधि बिंदु के आधार पे किया है जिसमें हमने ये नतीजा निकाला है कि अपने मनोगत शक्तियों को कैसे मजबूत किया जाए और वो करने के लिए जिस तरीके से 1920 के दशक में चीनी पार्टी ने के के साथ ये अलायंस करने का वो किया था जो फर्स्ट यूनाइटेड फ्रंट जो वो हुआ था उसके बाद फिर वॉर के टाइम में तो वो अपनी मनोगत शक्तियों को मजबूत करने का वो था हालांकि उस समय की परिस्थितियां बहुत भिन्न थी तो मैं बस इतना कह रहा हूं कि आज के समय में भी हमें अलायसेज वो करने पड़ेंगे ताकि हम अपनी मनोगत शक्तियों को मजबूत कर सकें दूसरा एक कंफ्यूजन था कि हम लोग के पेपर में हम लोग ने इम्पीरियलिस्ट स्टेज का जो फंडामेंटल कॉन्ट्रोडिक्शन था उसको हमने लिखा है श्रम और पूंजी का और जहां पे हमने आज के दौर में सर्वहारा आंदोलन के लिए जो प्रधान अंतर विरोध है उसमें हमने पूंजीपति वर्ग और सर्वहारा वर्ग के बीच के अंतर विरोध का बात किया था तो उसको लेकर थोड़ा कंफ्यूजन हो गया था तो वो क्लियर हो गया कंफ्यूजन एरिक को ऐसा लगा कि हम लोग ने आज के सर्वहारा आंदोलन के कार्यभार के रूप में श्रम और पूंजी का अंतर विरोध देख लिया था जो कि एकदम एक आर्थिक चीज पे उसको ले आके अपचयित कर देना होगा प्रधान अंतर विरोध को फिर दूसरी बात यह है कि नेशनल जो बुर्जुआजी है वो एक पॉलिटिकल सेंस में नेशनल बुर्जुआजी इन सब जगहों पर है जो राष्ट्रीय पूंजीपति वर्ग है वो एक पॉलिटिकल सेंस में इन सब जगहों पर है जो ये जो तीसरी दुनिया के देश हैं चाहे वो वैसे दिखलाई ना पड़े किसी रूप में लेकिन राजनीतिक अवस्थिति जो कुछ सामाजिक संस्कार अपना रहे हैं वो राजनीतिक अवस्थिति अपनाने के अनुसार उनको कहा जा सकता है कि वो राष्ट्रीय पूंजीपति वर्ग हैं दूसरा उन्होंने कहा कि राष्ट्रीय प्रश्न को राष्ट्रीय मुक्ति आंदोलन पे नहीं लाया जा सकता है राष्ट्रीय मुक्ति आंदोलन का टास्क न रहे तो भी राष्ट्रीय प्रश्न हो सकता है और उस राष्ट्रीय प्रश्न के समाधान के लिए बनेगा अलायंस मतलब राष्ट्रीय पूंजीपति वर्ग के साथ फिर उसके उदाहरण के तौर पर उन्होंने कहा कि जैसे अभी तूफान आया था हरिकेन वॉट वॉज द नेम ऑफ द हरिकेन विच डेवस्टेटेड राहत कार्य अरे कोई भी नाम हो कोई तूफान था उस तूफान को थोड़ी ढूंढ के लाना वो जो भी नाम था एक तूफान आया था तो उसमें जो ब्लैक आबादी के इलाकों में तबाही मची तो वहां पे ठीक से रिलीफ वर्क कुछ हुआ नहीं और बहुत ही सौतेला बर्ताव किया गया तो उसके खिलाफ जो संघर्ष हुआ एरिक कह रहे हैं कि वो भी राष्ट्रीय संघर्ष है या कुचाबाम्बा में जो निजीकरण के खिलाफ संघर्ष हुआ वो भी राष्ट्रीय संघर्ष है तो वो कह रहे हैं कि उसको राष्ट्रीय मुक्ति से ही जोड़ के नहीं वो किया जाना चाहिए उसके बिना भी हो सकता है राष्ट्रीय प्रश्न फिर माओ के कोर्ट में उन्होंने बताया कि बैंकर बिजनेसमैन इंडस्ट्रियस्ट बिग लैंड जिन्होंने इंपीरियलिज्म का पक्ष चुना है जिन्होंने मतलब इंपीरियलिज्म का जो साथ दे रहे हैं वो सभी कंप्रेडोर बुर्जुआजी हैं जो इंपीरियलिज्म का साथ दे रहे हैं हाँ दूसरा था वो मानते हैं कि सीरिया में जिस 1970 के दशक में एक स्वतंत्र राजनीतिक स्वतंत्रता रखने वाली ही बुर्जुआ सरकार थी बुर्जुआ वर्ग था जिसने की भूमि सुधार वगैरह किए और 1970 में वो कोई कंप्रेडोर नहीं था 1970 में सीरिया में जो था वो एक स्वतंत्र बुर्जुआ वर्ग ही था प्रतिक्रियावादी हो या जो भी हो लेकिन वो नेशनल बुर्जुआ जी नेशनल बुर्जुआ था 1970 के दशक में लेकिन अब वो नहीं रह गया है मरिया हाँ 
तो और आखिरी था कि जीपीसीआर के बारे में हम लोग के जो एक अलग विचार है कि उनका मानना है कि जीपीसीआर के बाद के दौर में भी जो जारी रहा और जिसको बाद में पार्टी ने नियंत्रित किया वो दर्शन पार्टी के भीतर की बुर्जुआजी ने किया उसको नियंत्रित और मतलब वो एक तरीके से बाद के दौर में जो उत्तरार्ध है जीपीसीआर का मतलब आप एक तरीके से कह सकते हैं उनहत्तर सत्तर के बाद जो जीपीसीआर का दौर है उसमें एक तरीके से मतलब रिवर्सल हो गया था वापिस पार्टी में एक नई जो राजकीय बुर्जुआजी थी ना उसने उसने जो विद्रोह हो रहे थे जन विद्रोह हो रहे थे जो कि वास्तव में सर्वहारा हेडक्वार्टर को मजबूत कर रहे थे और जो मतलब आगे बढ़ा रहे थे क्रांति को उनको एक तरीके से पार्टी ने नियंत्रित पार्टी में जो ये रिएक्शनरी वो फिर से जम गया था मामला उसने नियंत्रित किया उसको रोक दिया एक तरीके से प्रक्रिया को तो वहां पे एक हम लोग के अलग विचार बनते हैं मैं जो जवाब है वो उस पर आता हूँ अपने पहले मैं अंग्रेजी में दे देता हूँ फिर हिंदी में ट्रांसलेट करूंगा Again, uh, there is no disagreement on the question of uh, the fact that uh, we can strengthen our subjective forces only if we ally with a broad cross-section of the masses who are either victim of national oppression or any other oppression, any other form. For example, in India, uh, the, the, we should ally with the Dalits fighting against caste oppression in the similar way. So there is no disagreement about that fact. Uh, we totally agree. The point is, uh, who is there to ally with? On which uh, Eric said that there would be a national bourgeoisie in all these countries in the political sense. So uh, the basic question is that can there be a class in the political sense without having its existence simultaneously also as a social class? If there is no social class, can there be a class purely in the political sense? That is the basic question. So, for example, in Syria, can we uh, visualize a class in the purely political sense, not uh, in the social sense? So, the, so there is no national bourgeoisie existing in the social sense, but there is a no national bourgeoisie existing in the political sense. What is it if not idealism? So if in Syria, for example, I already mentioned the case where there is an imperialist aggression, not necessarily for colonization or neo-colonization. In that sense, we, are, we will also ally tactically with the sections of bourgeoisie which are not national and yet fighting against imperialist aggression. So that is a different thing, that we will ally with any part of bourgeoisie, even any part of aristocratic class which is fighting against imperialist intervention or aggression. That is already accepted by us. That is not the issue of contention here. The issue of contention is here is about the strategic class alliance. <coughs> Who, with whom, strategically, the Communist Party or the proletariat will ally with? That is the basic question. So, where is the national bourgeoisie, first of all, in the social sense, as a social class? If there is no national bourgeoisie in the social sense or as a social class, from where this uh, national bourgeoisie as a political class coming? <coughs> Secondly, if we uh, characterize all movements against privatization as dictated by the senior partner or as dictated by the imperialist institutions, Bretton Woods institutions like IMF, WTO as national question, for example, like Kuchabam, I don't know about Kuchabamba movement because I heard about this movement when Lata read his paper, I, before that I knew nothing about it. But if it was a movement against privatization, which was being undertaken at the behest of the imperialist forces, how does that make it national movement? And if that's national movement, when the pro, uh, provisional government was formed after the February Revolution in Russia, Russia was being pushed into, into the war and the Russian soldiers were being slaughtered on the orders of the provisional government at the behest of the French and British imperialism. So was it national oppression? Was Russia being nationally oppressed between February 1917 and October 1917? So if 
we classify every movement against privatization or neoliberal policies or for example in india in a dalit uh, majority area if an earthquake comes and the indian capitalist state which has a clear cut class caste character also this indian capitalist state uh, shows a very sotela bartao ko kya bolenge step motherly treatment towards the, the affected area and doesn't do sufficient relief work for the earthquake victims in the dalit dominated area does that make it an issue of simply simply an issue of caste struggle i don't think so so in that sense if we cannot create and then you are creating a new definition as far as i know that is not the position of a, a communist movement internationally in the history because if we include all these things a host of things even in the most advanced countries and even with the nationally not oppressed people for example what about tony blair sending british soldiers without taking the kya bolenge sahmati lene ko consent of the parliament to die in afghanistan is it the national oppression of british people by the us then this whole definition becomes so all encompassing that it explains everything and explains nothing at the same time so the national oppression should be de defined in a particular fashion method <coughs> with a particular uh, correct method so again about mao's quote uh as i said in a comp it's the question of principal character what is the principal dominant character of chinese bourgeoisie every comprador big bureaucratic bourgeoisie also has some industrial elements in it 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 is the commercial bureaucratic bourgeoisie in the main so what was the character of chinese bourgeoisie when mao was writing this and my basic question was simply this that today many uh, for example greek bourgeoisie how do we characterize that bourgeoisie greek bourgeoisie totally capitulated to german imperialism is it a comprador bourgeoisie then greece is in the stage of new democratic revolution because that bourgeoisie took the sides of german imperialism but it can take the side of german imperialism with certain conditions which stipulate its own interest as a junior partner so the other of this statement will be that unless and until all the bourgeoisie oppose imperialism they are comprador the natural corollary of this logic is this that since the bourgeoisie took the position of imperialism in certain situation so it should be anti imperialist <coughs> so uh, there can be only two forms of bourgeoisie national bourgeoisie and comprador bourgeoisie apart from imperialist bourgeoisie in the third world the bourgeoisie can either be national or be comprador there is no space to uh, theorize the emergence of this new uh, kind of bourgeoisie in the third world countries so we have we must stick with the old categories to understand the new realities that is the logic basically because many bourgeoisie even in the advanced capitalist countries are taking the position of imperialism sometimes against the interest of that nation so this logic runs into a host of contradictions in my opinion so about the syrian bourgeoisie eric accepts that in 1970s it was not comprador bourgeoisie but now it is this statement also is contradictory a national bourgeoisie can become comprador for example in very specific certain situations in which a carpet bombing and complete devastation of that country destroys the industrial base of that bourgeoisie destroys that uh, the economic power of that bourgeoisie and reduces it to shambles and only then it can be turned into comprador a national bourgeoisie cannot be smoothly turned into a comprador bourgeoisie it cannot 
So what happened between 1970s and 2017? Something must have happened. We need to explain that otherwise we are not deriving the truth from facts, but we are deriving truth from the 63 general line. And that's what I said, that tasks for or analysis of present condition in certain ways has been deduced from the 63 general line. So we cannot just say that, okay, in 1970s it was national, now it is comprador. It doesn't happen like that in history, in my opinion. That's it. Hare Ram. So, I have said this. हाँ जब ये बात आई कि भाई कई देशों में ऐसा हो सकता है एरिक ने कि सीधे सीधे कोई नेशनल बुर्जुआजी ऑर्गेनाइज्ड एक संगठित राजनीतिक ताकत के तौर पर नहीं दिख रही हो लेकिन कुछ लोग नेशनल बुर्जुआ माने जाएंगे क्योंकि वो पॉलिटिकल पोजीशन नेशनल बुर्जुआजी जैसी ले रहे हैं एंटी इम्पीरियलिस्ट पोजिशन मतलब ले रहे हैं तो मेरा सवाल ये था कि क्या सामाजिक अर्थों में वर्ग के तौर पर अस्तित्व मान हुए बगैर कोई वर्ग राजनीतिक तौर पर वर्ग के रूप में अस्तित्व मान हो सकता है मतलब सामाजिक तौर पे वो वर्ग अस्तित्व मान नहीं है ही नहीं और वो वर्ग राजनीतिक तौर पे अस्तित्व मान है तो ये एक किस्म का आदर्शवाद हो जाएगा किसी वर्ग को राजनीतिक तौर पे हालांकि ये मानते हुए कि राजनीतिक उसका एक वर्ग के तौर पे जब वो होता है तो उसकी अपनी स्वायत्तता होती है उसके सामाजिक वर्ग के तौर पर होने से लेकिन सामाजिक तौर पर वो हो ही ना और सिर्फ राजनीतिक तौर पर हो ये आदर्शवाद हो ये प्रोडक्शन रिलेशन और मोड ऑफ प्रोडक्शन से कट कर बात कर रही होगी दूसरी बात यह थी कि राष्ट्रीय प्रश्न को राष्ट्रीय मुक्ति युद्धों पे एरिक का कहना है कि नहीं वो किया जा सकता मेरा यह कहना कि और उसमें फिर सबको जोड़ दिया जाता है राष्ट्रीय प्रश्न में जैसे कि हरिकेन मरिया के आने पर जो ठीक से ब्लैक इलाकों में रिलीफ वर्क नहीं हुआ तो उसको भी नेशनल ऑपरेशन बता दिया जाता है कुचा बाम्बा मूवमेंट में जो हो रहा था उसको भी नेशनल ऑपरेशन के खिलाफ बता दिया जाता है क्यों क्योंकि वहां पर एंटी इंपीरियलिस्ट पोजीशन कोई बुर्जुआजी जो है वो नहीं मतलब नहीं ले रही थी और वहां पे नेशनल ऑपरेशन हो रहा था फिर तो 1917 फरवरी के रूस जब वहां पर जनवादी क्रांति हुई और एक आरजी सरकार अस्तित्व में आई उसके बाद फिर आ, क्या बोलते कि वहां पे ब्रिटिश और फ्रेंच इंपीरियलिज्म के कहने पर उनकी शह पर या उनके कहा जाए दबाव में जो वहां की आरजी सरकार थी वो रूसी सैनिकों को कटने के लिए भेज रही थी प्रथम विश्व युद्ध में तो उसने एक साम्राज्यवाद विरोधी पोजीशन नहीं ली तो इसका मतलब वो राष्ट्रीय दमन था तो 19 अक्टूबर में दूसरी जनवादी क्रांति होनी चाहिए थी रूस में फिर समाजवादी क्रांति नहीं होनी चाहिए थी तो ये एक सवाल फंसता है फिर माओ के उस कोटेशन पे बात आई जिसमें बात है कि बड़े पूंजीपति वर्ग की बात की गई है जिसमें बैंकर व्यवसायी मतलब बिजनेसमैन व्यवसायी और व्यवसायियों से अलग उद्योगपति और बड़े भूस्वामी की बात की गई है और साथ में प्रतिक्रियावादी बुद्धिजीवियों की बात की गई है जो मिलके दलाल पूंजीपति वर्ग का यह पहला ड्राफ्ट है क्लास एनालिसिस ऑफ चाइनीज सोसाइटी का फर्स्ट ड्राफ्ट में यह बात है सेकेंड ड्राफ्ट में क्लियर कट कहा गया है कि वो कॉमर्शियल बुर्जुआजी ही हो सकती है तो वो पहले ड्राफ्ट को कोट किया था एरिक ने दूसरे ड्राफ्ट को रिवाइज करके बनाया गया था ये स्पष्ट नहीं हुआ कि रिवाइज किसने किया था माओ ही ने किया था तो तो अलग बात हो जाती है माओ ने ओ सो इट वाज रिवाइज्ड बाय माओ द आर्टिकल या तो अगर माओ ने किया था तो फिर यह सवाल हो जाता है कि हम अर्ली माओ को मानते हैं या लेटर माओ को मानते हैं यह बात हो जाएगी लेकिन हाँ उस पर अभी नहीं जाते हैं सवाल यह है कि माई बेसिक क्वेश्चन वॉज कि इंडस्ट्रियल बुर्जुआजी या एट दिस पॉइंट आई फॉरवर्ड टू मैं इवन इफ माओ सेट दैट वी स्टिल need to explain how and why an industrial bourgeoisie which is not uh, ancillary industry type industrial bourgeoisie but which is industrial bourgeoisie producing finished product for consumption for a broad section of society cross section of society how and why can it be comprado which is based on real subsumption of labor and expanded reproduction ye ek sawal ka bhi jawab dena padega mao ne kuch bhi kaha ho wo to padh ke samajhna hi padega aur janna padega lekin 
रखना नहीं होगा उसको भी आलोचनात्मक तरीके से देखना पड़ेगा तो खैर ये एक सवाल आया था जिसका मैंने पहले ही कहा था कि इन प्रिंसिपल वो बुर्जुआ जी क्या है इससे तय होगा किसी दलाल नौकर शाह बुर्जुआ जी का भी एक हिस्सा उसमें कुछ इंडस्ट्रियल एलिमेंट तो होंगे लेकिन वो ये होगा कि मुख्य रूप से उस पूंजीपति वर्ग का चरित्र दलाल है या नेशनल चाहे रिएक्शनरी नेशनल हो चाहे प्रो पीपुल नेशनल हो लेकिन दलाल है या नेशनल फिर सीरिया पे बात है कि एरिक ने स्वीकार किया कि 1970 के दशक में सीरिया में नेशनल बुर्जुआजी ही थी लेकिन अब वो कंप्रेडोर है तो ये बताना पड़ेगा कि 1970 से 2017 के बीच में क्या हुआ वो कंप्रेड वो नेशनल से कंप्रेडोर कैसे हो गई जैसे बीच में ऐसा तो हुआ ना कि सीरिया को एकदम तबाह बर्बाद करके वहां की बुर्जुआजी की सारी आर्थिक शक्तिमत्ता को कुचल दिया गया हो ऐसा तो कुछ हुआ नहीं उस सूरत में ऐसा हो सकता है कि पूरा औद्योगिक आधार और आर्थिक शक्तिमत्ता किसी पूंजीपति वर्ग की तबाह हो जाए और वो एक तरीके से सबड्यू हो जाए और सबड्यू हो के कॉम्प्रेडोर में तब्दील हो जाए दैट इज पॉसिबल वो हो सकता है बट नथिंग ऑफ दैट दैट शॉर्ट हैपेंड विद सीरियन बुर्जुआजी बिटवीन नाइनटीन सेवेंटी एंड ट्वेंटी वैसा कुछ हुआ नहीं सीरियन बुर्जुआजी के साथ उन्नीस से दो के बीच में तो कैसे वो कॉम्प्रेडोर बन गई क्या हुआ यही था So regarding this question of political class and social class, the first point Comrade Abhinav made, nowhere did I say that there can be a political class without a social class. Korla, social basis. It's a, a, a point of analysis. One begins with forces fighting against national oppression, and then one determines what is the class nature of that force, rather than the other way around. In the U.S., uh, often uh, communists will debate who are the labor aristocracy by looking at economic statistics. Rather than looking at who are the labor aristocracy, which is a, it's a political concept, and then from when one sees who is the labor aristocracy, one can determine socially who are the labor aristocracy. Yes. On the question, how can an industrialist bourgeoisie be comprador? Again, one has to begin with the comprador forces. It's a political concept. And then determine what the social basis. Of course, I agree that we have to look at the Mao quote. I don't think we can make. Uh, Comrade Abinov uh, said earlier that we should always stick with the, the late later Mao as a, a rule of thumb. No, no, I didn't say that. I said that's matter of choice. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, and then on the Syria point, um, I was not attempting an analysis. I said simply a description. But Abhinav said nothing has happened that could have driven the regime into the hands of the Russians. And I would say the current war, uh, you had said a, a carpet bombing that destroyed the whole com country, uh, something like that has happened in Syria these past years. That's it. पहले एरिक ने जो बोला हिंदी में ट्रांसलेट करते रहूं उन्होंने कहा कि हाँ कि उन्होंने कहा कि नेशनल जो राष्ट्रीय दमन के खिलाफ जो लड़ेगा वो उसको राष्ट्रीय बुर्जुआजी माना जाएगा जो लड़ रहा है तो जैसे कि कई लोग अमेरिका में लेबर अरिस्टोक्रेसी का जो पूरा की पूरी अवधारणा है उसका एक आर्थिक व्याख्या करते हैं कि ज्यादा वेतन पाने वाले लेबर अरिस्टोक्रेसी में चले जाते हैं जबकि एक राजनीतिक अवधारणा है पहला तो ये था दूसरा ये था कि वही चीज की इंडस्ट्रियल बुर्जुआजी भी कपराडोर हो सकती है क्योंकि एक राजनीतिक अवधारणा है ये कोई आर्थिक अवधारणा नहीं है ये कोई इकोनॉमिक कंसेप्ट नहीं है पॉलिटिकल कंसेप्ट है कि कंप्राडोर क्या होता है तो इसलिए इंडस्ट्रियल बुर्जुआजी हो सकती है कंप्राडोर दूसरा उन्होंने कहा कि माओ ने शायद बाद में हो सकता है इसलिए उसको बदल दिया हो और उसमें वो इंडस्ट्रियल बुर्जुआजी को नहीं जोड़ा हो कि शायद पुनर्निर्माण के समय में इंडस्ट्रियल बुर्जुआजी के साथ एल करने की जरूरत थी और उसको पढ़ के मतलब थोड़ा एक कड़वाहट बनती और जो राष्ट्रीय बुर्जुआजी थी औद्योगिक बुर्जुआजी थी जो कि कंप्रेडोर थी लेकिन क्रांति के बाद पुनर्निर्माण के दौर में उसको इसलिए संशोधित हो सकता है किया गया हो जैसे लिन ब्याव के बारे में जो लिखा गया था वो भी लिन ब्याव ज़्यादा इम्बेरेस्ड ना हो इसलिए उसका एक हिस्सा एडिट कर दिया गया था तो उन्होंने ये एक जटिल प्रश्न है हम लोग को सारे संस्करणों को देखना चाहिए और फिर फैसला करना चाहिए तीसरा यह आया कि ऐसा मेरा कहने का कतई मतलब नहीं था कि केवल राष्ट्रीय और कंप्रेडोर बुर्जुआजी होती है मैं मानता हूं कि जूनियर पार्टनर बुर्जुआजी भी हो सकती है ये उन्होंने अगली बात जो कही और उन्होंने कहा कि असद को मौजूदा वॉर ने कंप्रेडोर बनाया है इससे पहले मतलब वो नेशनल बुर्जुआजी की भूमिका में ही था और इस युद्ध ने उसको इतने बुरी तरीके से तबाह कर दिया है कि अब वो दलाल बन गया है तो The a point about uh, defining the labor aristocracy by a variety of uh, so-called left forces in the U.S. as the highly paid workers is totally wrong, and the point is well taken. Uh, in in fact, in our organizational visits to the U.S., uh, a number of comrades, one of the issue of contention between us and them was this, because they think that the entire white working class is bought off; it constitutes a labor aristocracy. Which is a totally nonsense uh, thing to say. So that is totally agreed, and I again reiterate: there is no disagreement on the question of the difference between class existing as a political class and class existing as a social class. So, but the basic question is: for example, in a country like India, or in a country even in a country like Syria, just consider for one moment that there was no imperialist aggression. and there was no question of fighting against the clear and present uh, imperialist bombs and uh, war planes flying over uh, uh, their heads if that question was not there then where is the next because class whether the class is there in the society politically or not is not doesn't doesn't simply depend on the fact whether there is an imperialist aggression or not just consider the syrian society just before the imperialist attack on syria the when syria became the site of inter imperialist rivalry then where was this national bourgeoisie which had something common with the people 
which without imperialist aggression, clear and present imperialist aggression, without that, which was anti-imperialist. Where was that? that? Only then we can assess whether really there is a national bourgeoisie in the Syrian society as a social class as well as a, as well as, as a political class. So, because in the conditions of war, even the Comprador KMT, Mao approached to ally with the Comprador because in that particular conjuncture of Japanese invasion, so it doesn't de determine the class structure of the society or class contradiction of the society or the particular political cla uh, class contradiction of the society at that point of time. So in this situation of war, yes, it is possible to ally with even the most reactionary comprador bourgeoisie, yes, it is possible to ally with the most reactionary national bourgeoisie because the immediate question is the fighting against the imperialist aggression. But we have to study the Syrian society not only uh, as a result, what is happening in the, as a result of imperialist aggression, what is happening in the Syrian society. We cannot reduce the entire analysis of Soviet, uh, Syrian society, class analysis of Syrian society created in the particular political conjuncture created due to uh, imperialist aggression. So that is one point. Secondly, again if we say that industrial bourgeoisie is a political concept and we accept what is an industrial bourgeoisie. Industrial bourgeoisie is a bourgeoisie which is predominantly industrial, engaged in expanded reproduction, producing finished products for consumption, wants market. But if it is that, can its existence as a political class be completely opposite to its existence as a social class? That is the basic question. So the basic, I reiterate, and this is not an economistic question, that industrial bourgeoisie for a long period of time without any immediate imperialist aggression, how can it be comprehensible? And if Mao revised that, on the one hand, I agree with uh, Eric that we need to see both the versions. The versions which was not unrevised by Mao and I would just say from a dialectically other position that we also need to understand why, made, why Mao made that revision and we also need to look at that because he revised it to commercial bourgeoisie. Why? So in the, uh, about Asad, that uh, between 1970-2017, this war is taken as the turning point when the national bourgeoisie was turned into comprador bourgeoisie. It was driven into the arms of Russian imperialism as a comprador bourgeoisie because the bombing totally destroyed its uh, industrial base and whatever. I mean, it was totally destroyed economically, politically, and it was forced to... Uh, go into the arms of Russian imperialism as a comprador bourgeoisie. This, I think, uh, I have, I'll have to think about it, uh, whether this bombing made uh, Assad a comprador bourgeoisie and uh, we need to probe it a little bit more because one war like this, if it can change, then what about the, for example, Britain, just after the Second World War? totally destroyed, industrial capacity reduced to its 20-25%. What was the character of British bourgeoisie in 1945, just at the end of the war? When it was, it had become totally a dependent kind of, a, in certain sense, a kind of a dependency of US imperialism and many other advanced capitalist countries of Europe. Is it possible? With Syria also, though it's not an advanced capitalist country in that sense in which Britain and France were. But can we really uh, uh, rely on this logic that this war uh, made him a comprador? Then what about the Second World War, post-Second World War, European bourgeoisie?
हाँ मतलब इस बात पे हम लोग की पूरा एग्रीमेंट है जैसे कि अमेरिका में बहुत सारे वहाँ के वामपंथी हैं जो कि उसको वो करते हैं क्या बोलते हैं लेबर एरिस्टोक्रेसी को बोलते हैं कि जो ज़्यादा तनख्वाह पाता है वो लेबर एरिस्टोक्रेसी है तो ये भी एक बहुत बड़ा गलत तरीके की परिभाषा है लेबर एरिस्टोक्रेसी एक राजनीतिक वो है और हम लोग की खुद की ही डिबेट होती थी बहुत सारे इस तरह के यूएस के संगठन थे जो ये बोलते हैं कि भाई कुछ जैसे इमानुअल नेस जैक कोप ये लोग बोलते हैं कि पूरा अमेरिका और पूरी पश्चिमी विश्व का समूचा श्वेत मजदूर वर्ग जो है वो बिक चुका है वो अब एक कुलीन श्रमिक वर्ग में तब्दील हो चुका है उस कुछ नहीं हो सकता उसका मतलब तो एक वो है तो उस पर तो हम लोग सहमति हैं लेकिन मतलब दूसरा उसी से जोड़ के ये बात आई कि फिर इंडस्ट्रियल बुर्जुआजी भी एक जो है वो राजनीतिक अवधारणा है और इंडस्ट्रियल बुर्जुआजी हो सकता है कंप्रेडोर बुर्जुआजी कंप्रेडोर बुर्जुआजी भी एक राजनीतिक अवधारणा है और कोई औद्योगिक बुर्जुआजी भी अगर प्रो इम्पीरलिस्ट पोजीशन लेती है तो कंप्रेडोर हो उसको कहा जा सकता है तो इस पर मेरा ये कहना था कि हाँ फिर मतलब उस तरीके से तो बहुत सारे देशों पे ये बात लागू होगी जहां पे जैसे मान लीजिए कोई जूनियर पार्टनर भी अगर साम्राज्यवाद के पक्ष में कोई चीज कर रहा है या उसके पक्ष में अपने देश में निजीकरण और नवदारीकरण की नीतियां लागू कर रहा है तो उसको भी फिर कॉम्प्रेडोर बोर्ड दिया जाएगा तो मतलब बुर्जुआजी की दो ही किस्म रह गई जो साम्राज्यवाद के विरोध में खड़ा है वो कंप्रेडोर हो नेशनल हो गया और जो उसके साथ दे रहा है वो कंप्रेडोर हो गया और वो साथ किस रूप में दे रहा है इससे कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ता है वो किसी भी रूप जूनियर पार्टनर के रूप में साथ दे रहा हो तब भी वो कंप्रेडोर हो गया वो किसी और रूप में दे रहा हो तब भी कंप्रेडोर हो गया फिर ये बात है कि माओ ने क्यों उसको संशोधित किया था चीनी समाज में वर्गों के विश्लेषण वाले लेख को तो उसमें ये एरिक का कहना था वो जो बताया ही मैंने तो उसमें मैंने था कि फिर दूसरे संस्करण को भी देखा जाना चाहिए अगर माओ ने ही संशोधन किया था तो उसको लेकर अटकलबाजी नहीं कर सकते कि पुनर्निर्माण के दौर में उसको औद्योगिक पूंजीपति वर्ग को साथ लेने की जरूरत थी इसलिए औद्योगिक वर्ग के बारे में जो औद्योगिक पूंजीपति वर्ग के बारे में जो नकारात्मक बात कही गई थी उसको संपादित करके निकाल दिया गया और उसको मतलब उसके लिए थोड़ा सा ठीक सा बना दिया गया इस तरह की अटकलबाजी करने के बजाय हमें ये देखना चाहिए कि कुछ सोच के ही उन्होंने संशोधन किया होगा अगर संशोधन किया माओ ने तो कुछ सोचकर ही किया होगा उसमें हमें माओ के राजनीतिक विवेक पे ज्यादा जोर देना चाहिए बजाय कि उस समय की तात्कालिक राजनीतिक जरूरतों के हिसाब से माओ अपनी कोई सैद्धांतिक पोजीशन बदल दें ये थोड़ा दिक्कत तलब लगती है बात वन पॉइंट वॉज लेफ्ट दैट यू सेट दैट माओ माइट हैव चेंज रिवाइज दैट पोर्शन ऑफ एनालिसिस ऑफ क्लासेज इन चाइनीज सोसाइटी मे बी बिकॉज ड्यूरिंग द पीरियड ऑफ रिकन्स्ट्रक्शन देर वॉज द नीड टू टेक द इंडस्ट्रियल बुर्जोजी This, uh, I'm not sure whether it would be justified on our part to make that kind of speculation because it is very unlikely, given that Mao always gave primacy to theoretical and political, uh, taking a correct proletarian position. That Mao revised a theoretical assessment or theoretical article uh, written by him due to uh, some political exigency. There must have been some theoretical consideration behind the revision, rather than explaining it on the basis of the political exigencies faced by the Chinese Communist Party and Mao at the time of. Ah? Really yeah, one comrade told us that it was Mao who revised it. So we'll check the detail. Uh, given a. I edited words Mao there for fifty two के बाद जब चाइना होने लगा. Hmm. यही था तो और एक ये था कि असद के बारे में कि एक युद्ध अगर उसको दलाल में बदल दिया है तो एक युद्ध ब्रिटिश बुर्जुआजी को भी फिर दलाल में बदल दिया देता द्वितीय विश्व युद्ध के बाद वो भी पूरी तरह तबाह हो गई थी तो सिर्फ इस आधार पे नहीं कह सकते कि वो दलाल में तब्दील हो जाएगी साथियों साथियों सवाल दस हो चुके हैं और एक नाम और आया है प्रेम प्रकाश जी का 
तो अगर ज्यादा जरूरी ना हो तो हम चाहेंगे कि इसको समापन की ओर बढ़ाएं तो थोड़ा संक्षेप में बोलिए प्रेम प्रकाश जी छोटी सी बात है साथ ही एरिक के बातचीत में जो नेशनल बुर्जुआजी के कैरेक्टर को डिफाइन करने के लिए जो मेन चीज़ बताया गया है कि अगर नेशनल बुर्जुआजी अपने देश पे किसी तरह के साम्राज्यवादी कोई नीति के खिलाफ अगर वहाँ की जनता कोई प्रतिरोध कर रही है उसका खिलाफत कर रही है और उस केस में उस जनता की बात के साथ चला जाता है तो वो नेशनल बुर्जुआजी का करेक्टर होगा मुझे लगता है कि इससे अगर हम नेशनल बुर्जुआजी को डिफाइन करेंगे तो ये बहुत सिंपलिस्टिक हो जाएगा क्योंकि कई केस में साम्राज्यवाद के खिलाफ रास उस नेशन के पूंजीपतियों के हित को देखते हुए ग्लोबल पूंजी के पूरे संरचना में नेशनल बुर्जुआजी अपने देश में इस तरह से रिसोर्सेस की रक्षा के लिए अपने हितों को ध्यान में रखते हुए उस देश की जनता की किसी इस तरह की मांग के साथ चली जा सकती है और इसमें केवल उस मांग के साथ चली जाने के कारण उसको अगर हम कहेंगे कि वो नेशनल बुर्जुआजी है तो मुझे लगता है कि ये सरलीकरण होगा मैं एक एग्जाम्पल देता हूँ शायद वो जैसे कि नियामगिरी के केस में जो पाँच वाला कॉन्ट्रैक्ट था उसमें चाहे सुप्रीम कोर्ट के माध्यम से ही उसको कुछ देर के लिए भारतीय बुर्जुआ वर्ग ने टाल दिया तो इसके आधार पर अगर हम भारतीय भारतीय बुर्जुआ वर्ग के करेक्टर को नेशनल बुर्जुआ के रूप में अगर रेखांकित करें तो इसका मतलब यह है कि वो जो भारत का पूंजीपति है उसको भारत की जनता के साथ खड़ा होना चाहिए एक हद हाँ तक उसके संघर्षों के साथ तो ये मुझे लगता है कि ये कोई बात जो जहाँ से वो नेशनल बुर्जुआजी के करेक्टर को डिफाइन कर रहे हैं उसमें सरलीकरण है इसमें और भी सत्य संतुलन और पूंजी के ग्लोबल चेन के संबंधों को देखने की जरूरत है और मैं चाहूँगा कि इस पर साथी अभिनव और एरिक दोनों लोग थोड़ी बात रखें तो हमारी समझदारी में वृद्धि होगी धन्यवाद